Hey Jill, I have a question about what your experience has been like as an author. I know that YouTube is your primary job and you kick ass at it, but hmm. I was wondering. Thanks. When you first started writing novels, did you just dive in head first, even with some, with some planning outlining, or did you take courses coaching? So it's a little too generous to call me an author. I don't know if just having written a book and having people read it and everything counts as being an author. I guess it is, it's just if you're gonna be a published author, it has to be through traditional means. So my stuff was self-published, so I don't know if it fully counts. So I've always written stories, even from when I was a wee lad, it's just always been something that I do. My parents used to tell me that I used, used to just make stuff up even before my memory goes back. I would just say stuff. I always would like to write sound stories and everything in early life. I started reading quite early too. My parents would read me stories and I wanted to read more without them. so. I was reading quite early so I could do that. So it's always been part of me and I've always been planning stories and everything. I did take one class and that's kind of how I met Lily Bell really, kind of, in a writing class in high school. But that was it and I don't really think I got much out of it other than one of the repeated lessons that sometimes teachers, even though they can seem nice and cool, they can sometimes be very asshole -ish. And I think that's an important life lesson to have actually. So I'm glad that I took that course, but when it comes to the writing from it, not really. And back then I was more focused on poetry rather than prose, which is something I'm very happy that I got away from because yeah, definitely not a poet. So it is something I kind of dove into with writing novels, that sort of thing. But yeah, I wouldn't say any official coaching or whatever, but there was a period in my life around when World of Warcraft came out or just before World of Warcraft came out just to date it that pretty much I was going to university I was in the early stage relationship with Lily playing World of Warcraft starting my first job and also just reading and writing as much crap stories as I possibly could of other amateur writers. And for a while, even more than World of Warcraft, that was my biggest hobby and the most I spent my time with. I would find writing forums on DeviantArt even, but some of them were on LiveJournal and just any writing forum I could find. I would post my stories, but I would also read other stories written by people at the same level. And I would just leave these really, really long comments that kind of form the basis of some of the critique videos that you see now. It was really important to me that if I'm critiquing someone's work and I'm an amateur myself, I need to have reasons for it. So I need to show, you know, this is why I don't think this worked. This is why I did think this worked, blah, 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 blah. And that was how I learned a lot about writing. I can't really emphasize enough how much time I put into these things. You know, I would spend hours pretty much every single day just finding people's work and just reading it and leaving them these really long critiques. And it kind of took over something I spoke about before, which is that I used to just find people on ICQ and AOL. That was like one of my biggest hobbies when I first got the internet and the computer. And this kind of um, reading of different people's work is, is something that uh, replaced that for me because I would end up talking to the person as well. Yeah, I learned a lot from that, a like so much from that. In fact, it, it taught me something about myself is that I don't really understand something unless I can explain it to somebody else. And I also learn a lot by teaching and teaching is being very charitable for what I used to do. It's a stretch of the word, but I think you know what I mean. It was like something that I got a lot out of and I found it very fulfilling. I kind of miss it actually. And the videos kind of fulfill that part of it too. You know, like the videos are in the same kind of vein, but yeah. So I learned a lot from doing that. I think I would learn more from responding to people and picking apart their work. And I want to start very politely, you know, like here's what I think about this, this is what I think worked, this is what I think didn't work. And I think I got more out of that than when people did that to my own work. And they did. I usually would attract people that would come back and read my work and give my work the same treatment that I gave theirs. And that was really something that I appreciated and it was kind of like, it was almost addicting, you know? It's like you, you go in and you leave a big comment and then they might find something you did and leave a comment back just as a thank you. And I really got a lot out of that. So I didn't go into writing those books that are on Amazon right now, completely inexperienced and just diving right into it, but I didn't have any formal training or formal anything other than that one high school writing class, you know? I went into the writing on Amazon with the goal to make money. So it was like, okay, I read a guide online from someone who was like, I'm publishing this many stories 
every single month and I'm giving them very easy going, easy reading titles so people know what they are and they're selling quite well. And at the time we really, really needed money and you know, we had a lot of problems that we were going through. It was something that we could use to get some money and it worked. The goal was to make it very uh, pulpy and paperback and write them very, very quickly and not to worry too much about them. The saying was kind of, you can get 80% of the effect with 50% of the work, something like that. It's like of, of when you're in a project, you know, the last 50% of all the time and energy and fussing that you do only makes it 20% better. And that 20% better is something that um, is really worth it when it comes to like, like honing your art and honing your craft. But when it comes to something that's sort of, you know, readable and entertaining and pulpy to be specifically about writing, but I think any art is going to have the same thing. So I did that. And at the beginning, it was just kind of like, you know, just get them out there. Don't fuss nearly as much as I used to do for the amateur stuff that I used to put up and have. Amateur just sounds dirty now, huh? Whenever you say it, like, let's just a dead word for anything other than a specific website that we all know and love. I think, I think, yeah, that's, that's just dumb. I'm, st I'm still going to say it. Fuck it. I'm not, I'm not willing to give up on it anyway. So it was more about being entertaining and readable and they did their job. They were successful, but I have a lot of more literary ideas that I would love to get back to. And I was working on quite a few of them over the years when still going through other people's work. And I would love to get back to them at some point, but I don't know when that's going to be. I'd also like to finish the series that I have up on Amazon at the moment because Lily and I were very successful on Amazon until just one day they changed their algorithm for how they promote self-publish work. And our sales went from selling like 100 to 200 copies every single day to literally two, you know, like it, that was the drop off overnight, you know, 100 to 200 copies to, to one or two. And that's why I'm always worried about YouTube and everything. And every time YouTube changes how their algorithm works, it scares the fuck out of me. So yeah, there's that. Writing groups are, are difficult. Um, a lot of people that I was involved with in writing groups don't use them properly. It's just writers hate writing. It's probably the only form of art. Maybe, I don't know, I'm speaking out of ignorance here. Maybe visual artists and musicians go through it too. I don't know. But in my experience, writers hate writing. Uh, they love having written. And I'm definitely that, and almost all the writers I ever spoke to were in the same boat. Um, they would rather like enjoy their vices. They would rather talk about writing. They would rather sit around in writing groups and you know like oh here's my latest idea you know and then they just don't write for a while. So every writer is going to be different. It's not going to be true for all of them. But yeah, that saying I prefer to have written something than to actually be writing something is pretty true for almost every single writer that I've met. And writing groups are just a perfect way to fake yourself into thinking that you're writing. You know, I'm taking part of the writing group. I'm talking about writing today and you know, that's helping me with my writing. So, you know, that's all the work I have to do today. Dust myself off and pat on the back. So I think that they are a very great tool and that it's a great thing to be a part of if you can use it effectively but it's also kind of like drinking you know like just be aware of the dangers be aware that you might end up being a very negative thing for your craft as for official courses and stuff i don't know the high school one i had wasn't that great maybe they're way better at a university level but i think just to go like against my advice that i just said i think um discussing books and pulling them apart at, at a university level class is is like practice enough you know what i mean and I went to university for a year for that and then I had to drop out because I couldn't afford the tuition anymore because of stuff that happened with my family. And I enjoyed that, but there was also quite a lot of bullshit in the academic world when it comes to literary criticism. And that's what the T-Rex Runner video is all about, but I'm not fully committed to the idea, of course. I think there is something of value for that and I enjoyed those classes quite a bit and I wish I was able to have finished it. I just found a website recently that's helping me put my ideas together in a really uniform way where it takes you step by step through the process to highlight your core idea, characters, plot, setting, etc. It goes in depth and so far has been a great tool for me. Um, I'm very much a planner when it comes to writing. Uh, I, I always know what the beginning, middle and end is. And this is kind of like uh, different factions of writers. It seems to me that most writers uh, prefer to write like they're reading, which is that as they're writing, they're having this, these periods of discovery, just like you would when, you, when you're reading. So anything that has a story that, that a writer has, has deliberately written, um, you'll get to like a big revelation, a big plot twist, a big <gasps> moment, you know, the gasp moment. Um, and writing like you're reading means that when the writer got to there, they gasped too. Like they, they were writing, you know, on pen to paper or, you know, uh, on, a, on their typewriter if they're a hipster or they were like 
typing away and they got there and they were like, oh my God, you know what I mean? So that's what writing like you're reading is. And I hate that. And I feel like most writers do this because I feel like most writing shows a distinct lack of planning. I don't think planning is mutually exclusive when it comes to writing like you're reading and having these big moments. You can just have them when you are in your planning phase, you know what I mean? Because that's when you have the big moments, oh, that would be awesome, that would be great. And just because you have a plan doesn't mean that you always have to stick to it no matter what. You can change it. I don't expect anyone to have read my books or anything, but if anyone has read the Bounty Hunter series, the entirety of the cast character was not planned at all. None of that was planned. Nothing to do with her was ever planned. Every single scene that she's in, every single thing that happens with her, none of that was planned. So it's something that you can roll with so there's still that freedom. That character was brought into existence because I realized in the first story that I needed someone for the main character to talk to for the duration of the story. So that's a part of, you know, something and rolling with it throughout a whole entire, like, I think it's like grand total 400,000 words for that whole entire series with that character in it. Uh, so you still have that, but I like to be a planner and have almost everything mapped out. Don't think that that's the only way to do it. Just be aware that if you are gonna be like that, then you're gonna have to spend a lot of time in editing or else you're gonna end up with pricks like me saying that your ending doesn't make sense and you didn't think it through enough. Usually the endings suffer if you don't plan which is why Stephen King doesn't nail his endings very much, even though he's a, he's a pretty good writer. But yeah, any, any tool that helps you, then I'm, I'm really happy that, that you have that and go for it. And uh, anything that makes it more fun and interesting for you too, because like I said, the, the struggle to me when it comes to writing is actually writing, you know, it's, it's difficult. And it took me many years to get to the point where uh, I could consistently write every single day and was meeting my writing goals. And I, and I think that's still something I carry with me with my work ethic now. And it, once I got there, it never went away. And I'm happy about that. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, though. What do you mean? Like, you can plan. Yeah, that's you, what I was talking about, yeah? Yeah, but, like, to make it more fun. Mm -hmm. You can plan, but you can leave yourself enough wiggle room that... Like, there are some people who plan down to, I'm going to use this sentence in there somewhere. I want to use this word. I want to use this imagery. You know, like, there's some people that really plan not just what they're going to accomplish in a scene, but like down to the details of how they're going to accomplish it. And D isn't that just writing at that point though? If you're if you're being that specific, you know, like- But isn't like John Irving, I can't remember reading someone does that. Is it John Irving who does that? There's somebody who's really John, specific with John how Irving, they plan. John Irving only always knows the, the last sentence that he no, goes with. And I don't like, remember who. James Joyce famously has this thing where he would fuss over a whole entire sentence for, for days or even even weeks, supposedly, supposedly legendarily, he would do this. He would fuss over, you know, like where the placement of one word would be in, in a sentence and he would just be talking to his writer friends about it over and over and over again. And I think that's bullshit. He liked to troll a lot. I think it was Finnegan's Wake after he wrote Finnegan's Wake, legendarily dusted off his shoulders and said something like, yeah, good luck analyzing this, you, you literary assholes. You know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing what the legend says. I don't believe that's true. I don't think he was that particular about it. I don't think any writer is really that particular about that sort of thing. Poets, yes, but I don't think I just remember reading writers. something. I don't know what, where I read it or where I heard it. Maybe it was in an English class or something they were talking about. I think, that, I think it's him. I don't yeah. remember who, but I just know that some people tend to kind of over plan and I find that really boring. I don't like to plan that much. Yeah, I like to know when I write, I have the plot plotted out, what's going to happen, and then I break it into chapters. And then I have little notes for myself in each scene, and the scenes make up the chapter. And it'll say something like, Lana gets engaged, or, you know, whatever. Like, it's, it's not a big plot point. But it's something as simple as that. I don't say how she gets engaged. I don't say, you know, the build up to it or really what happens in the scene to me i know that that is what is happening in that scene or someone's uh, mental state deteriorates um sh show this you know and i i pick something that i think will show that they're starting to lose it a little bit but i don't say what it is and as i'm writing it it kind of comes out and those are usually my best moments are when they come out like that and it's a lot more fun than going in knowing exactly what's going to happen sure you're you're closer to writing by reading than i am and but i'm not as near of a careful planner as someone like john irving like i look at it as the plan is a skeleton and you just add layers onto the skeleton as you write yeah 
and there's lots of things where I might have a sentence in my head where I'm like, I'm definitely gonna say this at some point, or that's a really good line, or this is a really good hook for a scene or anything. But yeah, there a lot of things I've decided. It's a spectrum, right? It's not binary, and you have to find where you are. Just no matter what, you have to put the time in. It's like, do you want to plan a lot or do you want to edit a lot? You have to plan no matter what. Like you have to have some idea what the story is going to be in your head before you start writing or else you're not even going to write it. R write it. Wow. You're not even going to write it. Wow. Wow. Um, you have to add. You know, so you, so you, so you <laughs> have to you have to do at least a little planning, like no matter what. Yeah, I don't and know, you just... have to do at least a little editing. So it's like, where do you want to put the work in? Do you want to put the work in in the planning so you don't have to do as much editing? Or do you want to do the like way more editing so you don't have to do as much planning? Yeah. Just make it as fun. Like you were saying, this, this website sounds really cool that they can break it down for you that way but at the same time I might take some of the fun out of it right if you have every mm -hmm. step by step planned out when it comes time to actually sit down then and write it for me I always feel like I already know the story then I've already told the story because I've told it in note form I already know exactly what happens it's not fun for me anymore because I've, I've like over planned so I just plan enough that I can get through it and then Sometimes there'll be standout things I want to talk about, but I don't plan out every line or every every event that happens as it happens. You know, I just kind of let it, and then you can fix it later if you don't like it or you want to add something later. I go back and do lots of rewriting to it as I'm writing it. So you can make it more fun like that, I think. It's, it doesn't have to be so boxed in, you know? Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I just, you were talking about, um, you know, how you do it and stuff, and we do it a little bit differently, so. Should art and entertainment lose points because you had an idea in your head of what it was going to be or how you would prefer it to be and it didn't meet those expectations? Extra detail. I watched a movie recently where I came into it expecting an interesting take on the genre, in my opinion, and the movie delivered on my hopes for 75% of it then slid back down into a classic trope of the genre. This recontextualized the movie and made me realize the interesting plot points I was thinking were getting we're getting built we're actually working toward this slide the whole time so yes and no definitely so the question is uh should your basically should your expectations matter you know if you have certain expectations and then it turns out the media does not meet them for whatever reason it turned out that they were going to be doing something completely different you know like should that matter or not when it comes to judging something and the answer is yes and no so it all depends on if you think that you were were misled or not you know there have been reviews that i've done or, or videos that i've done on the channel where i thought that it was going to be something different because the marketing material of that game led me to think that and sometimes people are, are very very angry at me when I do this so something like minute to some extent maybe even forager and there's one other one too that uh, I get some comments on you know it's it's another episode of Joe expecting one thing and then blaming the game for it well in these cases it's, it's because the marketing material made me think that we were gonna have something else and that's the only reason why I was interested in the game to begin with so I think it's fair to be annoyed when it's that and you should still however take away your expectations and try to judge everything for how it is. But your example is a little more interesting to me because I feel like that's different. And your example was that you were thinking that the story was going a different way while you were watching it. And then it ended up being disappointing. Like, I feel like that's very different than having expectations going into it. You know, you were expecting the story to go in a certain way and then it didn't deliver. That's very, very different. And that's completely fair and it's always kind of disappointing when you expect more out of a story and you think that it's going to do more interesting things than it ultimately does i think that's completely different and it's, and it's more fair that's just like um you, you kind of get into the story and it just doesn't nail the ending for you yeah yeah for sure um i'm trying to think of some some examples again of times where i've been misled by the marketing materials praise almost the opposite i wasn't expecting something and it ended up being even better than i thought it was going to be so that's where it's it, like it's it's always good when it's a surprise, right? And it ends up being better. Hob a little bit. I was expecting Hob to be more Zelda-y and less just kind of like linear exploration of worlds over and over and over again. The witness misleads you with it with its uh, with its blurb at the beginning, you know, saying that there's no filler in that game when that game is just chock full of filler, like. Uh, sorry, Jonathan Blow. I know you're a huge fan of the streams and are always watching, but you know, like. I'm kidding, um, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's, 
you want again marketing is almost like no matter what your product is you want it you want to like even if your game is really really niche or you are appealing to a small demographic of people like you still want to appeal and, and put your best foot forward when it comes to marketing your stuff so you so you want to be like yeah this this game is going to be really great and you know you appeal to as many people as possible please try it up please try it. you might really like it and then you know you, those expectations because you're trying to cast such a wide net end up being like really misleading yeah, I think misleading in a positive way is always good if it's if it's a pleasant surprise. Pleasant, pleasant everyone likes surprises, right? Pleasant surprises are good, but um, when it's a, it's, it's if it exceeds your expectations in a different way, it's really fun. I feel like I'm rambling on this question. I'm really sorry. So yeah, I, th I think that's an interesting twist on the question is that uh, when you go into something and it ends up being better, you know, because it, it, it hits you with these different expectations and, um, and uh, there's a specific movie uh, about a cabin that I'm thinking of right now and hopefully that's enough without spoiling it that uh, that that pulls off that trick where you think okay it's gonna be it's gonna be this and it turns out that it's that's something else and it's even better than than you probably thought and that's really fun and I enjoyed that um, so it, it's only it only ever works if it exceeds your expectations if they're gonna subvert your expectations it has to be something that does it in a positive way for it to really work out well I think yes. They're saying something in the chat. My feelings are double fold that a movie failed to nail the ending for me to meet the needs of a broader audience and that I shouldn't begrudge a piece of media because I thought of something that matches my ideals rather than one that matches the general consensus. I suppose it may be about personal feeling versus agreeable profitability. But your profit the, like the profitability of, of the of the media doesn't doesn't really matter when it comes for you personally enjoying it you know what i mean like it's 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 nice to think of things like that like oh yeah you want it to be successful so these so these artists can go on and make some more things and and yada 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 it's it's like nice to think about and everything but at the same time it's like you know something could be really special if it was more tailored for you so yeah it's kind of a struggle to look at art that way that uh, especially in games lately where how do you balance the fact that it needs to be able to make money and it needs to appeal to as many people as possible and as it appeals to more and more people that experience gets diluted and that sounds really snobbish but it's that way for everyone you know it's everyone has their own niche tastes and as you get more and more toward appealing to everyone you start to appeal to no one very strongly so it can be a good experience for everyone or it can be a great experience for a few people and that's why i said it i think in the um three games to refund no man's sky video i think where i said you know like niche experiences are something that i'm really interested in now uh even if it's not a niche that i that i naturally like like i want i want to get into things that are really tailored toward a certain audience and you know get into that niche f for that experience because those experiences are just so compelling and so unusual and are so worthwhile you know like you get something really special out of those that you can't get out of these broader experiences and it has nothing to do with with being a snob it's just the reality of uh, trying to appeal to as many people as possible and you i think you see that when game companies get more money and it must happen to other mediums too like you know the, the game dev gets way more money way more budget and suddenly their games kind of aren't that good for you anymore and that's because their budgets are so high that they need their profits to be even higher and that means there's more risks associated so you think there would be less risk associated with the bigger titles when they're more financially comfortable but really it's there there are higher stakes now uh, and you can even see in youtube videos i'm kind of in that place now too you know like there there's a certain level of income that uh, I would like to sustain because I have plans for the future for eventually making a video game. So I, I need to try to tailor my content to still appeal to enough people in order to be able to, to continue to support that level of, 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 of income so I can you know, meet that goal that I want. Um, I still think that the videos themselves are just so niche that that doesn't really matter that much and it's not that great of a comparison compared to movies and, and games, but yeah, that's uh, that's definitely part of it. What main games you really appreciate respect from a writing story perspective has been asked a couple times. Not very many. Um, from, from writing, probably there... <sighs> Okay, so there, there are, there are two ways of looking at it. There's like the whole story and the whole sweeping thing that happens, you know, 
and there are very very few games that are impressive like that like even something like the new god of war and, and the last of us like th those are impressive by by video game standards but by any other medium you know it's like they're they're about average you know what i mean like it's like yeah they're good they wouldn't be considered bad in movies or or books or whatever um but they're not they're not um, fantastic, but for video games, there are because they're they're coherent and they actually you know have a a a central thematic point that runs throughout the whole entire thing. You know, what I mean, like it's it's good. You know, like they're they're decent and, and they don't like completely fall apart at the end. Um, but you know, for there's there's lots of games that have individual pieces that are really really cool from from a writing perspective. You know, like even something that's kind of trashed here, like like the new Tomb Raider games. You know, I really like Lara Croft characterization in those games um, the the story for the most part in the base game of Witcher 3 is absolute dog shit but there's really really good character moments and there's some really really good writing um, it's just that the story is really really bad so you can separate uh, just slip that one in huh just just going right through it yeah there's a there's like there's a difference between like the story and the writing you know like it's it's um, it's a little hard to explain but only a little you know like it's not it's not all that of a, a foreign idea you know um, I think that stuff like Soma and What Remains of Edith Finch are probably some of the best stories and writing that, that video games has. Um, I'm not really into stuff like Dark Souls and, and Hollow Knight, as most of you probably know, if you, like, I, I'm guessing most of you come from the videos, they're not, you're not here from Twitch, you know, like, I don't really like the, you know, you, you hear the ingredients, make the story yourself, I think it's just an excuse for it to have a story when it really doesn't. It's hard to name a bunch of really good, really good stories, that's why I was so disappointed when I played Silent Hill 2, because I was expecting it to be, you know, new like in my top five for, for really great stories in video games, and it was just like, oh, okay, you know, like, if uh, if this was a book or a movie, like I, I don't even think anyone would really be singing its praises at all. It would just be kind of like middle of the line sort of thing. Uh, I don't know. Like I think that the, some of the writing in like even something like Metal Gear Solid series is really good, even though the overall story is batshit. You know, like there were parts in Control that were really really cool. You know, like um, if we're talking about like comedy games and and things that are funny, like uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is really, really funny. I think intentionally funny in a lot of places. Portal 1 and 2 as well, you know, like really, like really powerful, but as a story, uh, Portal 2, not so good. Um, Portal, Portal 1, I think is a better story than Portal 2, but Portal 2 has more funny moments. Yeah, I think that's all I can say for now. Hey Joe, in case you have that issue, how do you deal with the anxiety of putting yourself out there? For example, sharing your views on a video of yours. So this used to be a really, really big problem of mine and um, I'm not really good at public speaking. I'm surprised that I, uh, that I can even get through streams and um, every so often, um, for no reason it seems, well, sometimes I'll, I'll, if I've taken a break from streaming and I come back to it, I'll be very, um, very nervous coming back to him like oh my god what if it doesn't go well this time you know like um like it's 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 gonna be like this is gonna be the one where i, I i'm i'm i can't even speak clearly even though i can't even speak clearly right now you know like I, it's gonna be really really bad you know like and, and it turns out it's usually it's fine um but when at the beginning when we first started i was terrified so i'm not really good at public speaking and i don't like being in front of an audience but i think because you're all invisible it doesn't matter uh, it, I, I can get through it. Uh, but what helped me with the videos was that um, I, I made a deal with myself really early on. It's like, okay, I, I can say whatever I want as long as I support it with evidence. As long as I can support it with examples and people can understand why I think the way that I do, then you know, it's fine. I, I can say whatever I want, you know, because if they're like, you know, I think you're crazy, I really disagree with you, you know, at least they can say, but I can see where you're coming from, you know, like at least I can understand it. So that's what, that's the deal I made with myself. And uh, I think that's I've I've been successful with that and uh, have been able to to get through making videos with uh, that rule. Uh, but sometimes I take it too far. I think with Odyssey I had too many examples, um, but that could have been alleviated by having um, having like a note at some point saying, "Whoa, what the fuck?" A note at a point saying, you know, if if you if I've convinced you, you know, you can skip ahead to this point in the video now. You know, you don't have to keep watching. But at the same time, maybe there's another dimension where. Uh, the Odyssey video is only an hour long and 
there and, and I'm sitting there on the stream right now saying, you know, I really wish I had kept all those examples on it because, you know, I, all that criticism I got for barely playing the game and not supporting my arguments and talking crap, you know what I mean? Like, so it's really hard to, to know uh, what was right and what was wrong there, but uh, a note there in the video saying, hey, if I've convinced you to skip ahead, I, I think wouldn't have hurt. But yeah, that's, that's how I got over it, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm a shy person, but I don't do fantastically in, in social situations. And whenever I had to give like group projects and presentations or whatever, um, I would I would be quite scared. Um, if I'm being really fully honest with myself, I think that if I was to ever give like a um, a a conference talk or whatever, anything like that, like a, like an in-person presentation, if I'm being 100% honest with myself, I think I could do it. I think that I could I could get past that and it would be okay. Um, but I would be I would be pretty terrified the whole time, the whole way there, you know? I, the whole time there, I'd be, I'd be dreading getting there and, dr and dreading going through with it, so. Uh, but I think when it, when push came to shove, I could get through it and I could do it. Uh, Shepard's a pretty good character. I really liked Miranda, because I because I uh, I had, had a crush on Yvonne Strahovski for a while. Um, and uh, I like that kind of character archetype. I, I like... Uh, I kind of like like I like bitches, but I, okay, like like she, I don't mean I like bitches. I mean like, like she she's a bitch. You know what I mean? Like the, the, it's the bitch archetype, but she's not a bitch to you. You know what I mean? Like I don't like the character that's that's a bitch to you. I like that she's kind of like a like like a bitch to she's bitchy. To, to, to everyone else. Not like just a bitch. She's bitchy. bitchy. There we go. Like Lily and I talk about like bitchy a lot. You know like. I like that. I like that she's she's bitchy. Whereas like like Miranda and Yennefer have quite a lot in common. Oh no, it's Witcher three again. Uh, but like Yennefer is a bitch to you, so it's like eh, like not not nearly as good as as um as Miranda. But I, I like Miranda, uh, more because of that. And um, not really keen on Liara or any of the other waifu choices. In um, he's a lovely woman, but he likes me. So what does that say? In uh, right. Yeah, but it's like. Right? Yeah, yeah, but it's it's like what what you like in media is not always you know what you go for. You know, I bet you're lovely. Mm. You're lo lovely, Lily. Mm. Lovely Lily, Lily Bell. What is your take on game situations where the trail and experience is the best, but then the climatic finish doesn't live up to it, ruins the adventure? I think it might make for a good video to talk about that situation. As I could see it going both ways, for and against an ending having that much impact on the experience as a whole. Uh, endings matter a lot to me, so um, probably way more than than for most people. And uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I don't know if the, if I should be like proud of, of the fact that endings are so so meaningful to me. Uh, I know that it should be for uh, it should all be about the. The, the journey, not the destination, but I'm more about it being about the journey and the destination. Endings matter a lot, and uh, it, it can work both ways. Like an, a really bad ending can ruin an otherwise great game, but a really great ending can uplift an otherwise kind of mediocre game, you know? Um, Nier Automata is a game that uh, has a really strong start, I think, and then it has a very meandering middle. And then, you know, it gets into its final phase and it's kind of like, oh, okay, it's getting better. And then the finish is just, oh my God. So it's like, that that, that really brings it back for Nier Automata for me. So I, I like that quite a bit. Uh, there's a scene in the movie uh, Adaptation. And if you've seen the movie Adaptation, sorry, if you haven't seen the movie Adaptation, it's with Nicolas Cage, uh, you should definitely go watch it. Uh, so Adaptation, is about Nicolas Cage, who is playing Charlie Kaufman, who is writing the script for adaptation. So it's it's a it's a, a meta movie that actually really pulls it off well. And uh, there's a scene where uh, Nicolas Cage as Charlie Kaufman, who also has a twin brother, who's also played by Nicolas Cage, uh, goes to see a writing like guru who's giving a presentation, and he has this this speech that he says, you know. Um, it, it doesn't matter what happens in your movie, you know, just wow them at the end and 
and that'll that'll satisfy them and keep them talking. The ending is all that matters. And I don't really agree with that. Like everything else that comes toward the ending needs to be set up to really punch it. But uh, if there's any part of something that needs to be done really well, uh, if you want the wow effect and you know that they're gonna stick around with the whole thing, then the ending is the most important, I think. But you know, that's assuming they're gonna stick around. So uh, I would say the beginning is actually the most important part of any piece of media. So you get them hooked and then you can kind of meander in the middle and then the ending can be fine. Because when I think of Nier Automata, I don't really think of that meandering middle all that much. Although it is worse for video games because video games go on for so much longer than most other other um, media. Yeah, I uh, yeah I think I think endings are, are very important to me. And video games, tend to do okay with it in terms of gameplay. There's usually a big boss at the end, right? Like, and that's, the, it's like a, a big climax of gameplay and everything that you've learned. Video games usually do all right. In terms of stories, uh, I think writing for video games is extremely difficult and, you know, endings aren't, are, are suffer just as much as anything else in video games because it's so hard to, to mesh a really good story with gameplay that goes on for 20, 30, sometimes 50 or even more hours, you know? Like, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> Someone in chat is talking about 21, 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, I don't, I don't know about that. Like, yeah, I, I can't, I definitely see where you're coming from, but it was kind of like, yeah, I watched that a long time ago, and uh, I was like, wait, what? And I don't know, it kind of stuck in my head, but yeah, it, it, I, I, I can, I can agree. I think, yeah, I can agree. Gotta stick on like Game of Thrones. Yeah, there's another one, you know, Ga Game of Thrones. A lot of people think that retroactively ruined everything, and it's like. You know, what's what's the best case scenario now for Game of Thrones is that forever you will think that it doesn't have an ending because that's the ending you got and it's, and it's so unsatisfying that it kind of ruins the characters for the rest of the thing. And then, and, and you're never going to get a proper ending because, you know, he's never going to finish the books. Uh, yeah. Sorry, we're meandering here, Ian. I don't, I don't, I, I, I think definitely, I, I, I think that the endings are very, very important. But, Which we're not landing ours very well. Yeah, and we're not landing ours very well for the stream, so maybe streams are immune to that sort of thing because it's more of a of a performance art and improvisation. Improv. Mm -hmm. Improv, sorry. Improv. But yeah. Maybe it could make a good video. And I can collect my thoughts because clearly I need to because they're all over the place for this one. I'd like to do some more videos on broad topics, but uh, they're not very popular. Let me read that again. Do you know what an author is? I don't. An author is, is someone that, um, I might not even fully understand this, but it's someone that, that demands a great amount of control about what they're making, and it's really coming from like this 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 one soul kind of place. Okay. So uh, most books would be considered that kind of thing, you know? But I guess it, there's a level of investment that's implied too. So some something like... Um, I don't know if chat would agree with this or not, but um, uh, Stanley Kubrick would be considered an author, you know, that made that made The Shining and uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, that sort of thing. They're usually very, very dense, deeper experiences that uh, that are often kind of controversial and difficult for people to, to get. But if they do get them, they're usually some of their favorites, that sort of thing. Okay. Can an artistic vision from an author cloud or prevent the product art being made from being as fully fleshed out as possible does the medium as a whole not support authors or take control or is author theory as a whole flawed for example did tetsuro nomura hold back kh3 from being the best game it could be does yoko taro's weirdness add to the value of his games or make them a bit of a hard to understand mess in other mediums, someone like Quentin Tarantino creates work that will almost always be the same, where his fingerprints are obvious, but because it's less chefs in the kitchen, it's easier, I think, for him to work. Cosmonaut Variety Hour made a, variety, made a video about Kingdom Hearts as a whole and made a point about how Nomura was an artist for a couple of Final Fantasies, not a writer. Does video game design with all of its moving parts make the role of an auteur more difficult? And I'm sorry if I butchered all those names because I have no idea what I just said. No, it's okay. Um, so this is a difficult question. And there's a lot of there's a lot of parts to it. So on the one hand, you're talking about uh, does does having like this this singular guided, very heavily directed vision does that is that something that's that art benefits from? And then you're also speaking about can games even really have that kind of guided 
singular vision because video games are so difficult to make and they and they by necessity you know it's very rare that one person can make every single thing in a game and even if they do it's it's never going to be on the same level as, as something that's like, something like the triple a um and uh whereas uh, books and movies don't really have that issue apart from when it comes to cgi but then again movies we spoke about this last time you know they have to have actors you know what i mean like unless you want to be like the you're the director you're you're setting up the camera you're also somehow acting in it all i guess you could have that when it comes to um an animated movie that you're the, you're the one that animates everything but that would be difficult and you also have to be able to do the music and and you know like possible but uh it's it's arguably way more it's it's a waste of time when you could be doing way more if you just had like one other person with you so it's not always going to be something that's that's solo at least i think um but the other part of your question is like what what about when the the, the supposed author comes from a place that they weren't a writer at first you know what i mean like they they were in your case an artist and they weren't really a writer and the writing suffers in this latest latest installment in the series um so there's a lot to work with here i would say that games small indie games can definitely have that kind of feeling and i definitely think that um with larger games like hideo kojima pulls it off i don't necessarily well does he though i don't know like maybe there's there's a lot of different writing credits i think we spoke about this in in the control stream right i think it was one of the like, i think the last con control stream that we did we were speaking about how and someone asked me a question about what do i think about the ending of of metal gear solid 2 and i said i i really feel like it was just amazingly prophetic and at the time i disliked it and i thought it was just fucking nonsense and now that i've gotten older like like he talks about memes and the the future of the internet and how and how we have to um we uh there's going to be not it's not the problem's not going to be that there's not enough information the problem is going to be that there's too much information and, and uh it's not about censorship it's about providing context and you don't even really need to censor things if you just provide the wrong context for it and you and you it's like post-truth i'm not even sure if he says post-truth in in metal gear solid 2 but it's really prophetic it's actually quite scary you know how how close we are to what the end of that game said and i said you know like if he wrote that you know, and, and when I was talking about it, I just assumed that he was the one that wrote that. You know, that's amazing. That proves that he's that he's a really good writer. Like that was the question: Is Hideo Kojima a good writer? But th the the thing that we spoke about um, in that during that stream was: Did he write that, or did he have a did he have help? You know, like is there is there someone that I, I think didn't Kubrick had someone that he always he always worked with, or there was like some some cinematographer or, or some some something like that that he always worked with sometimes authors have like a, a a partner you know that they always want to work with because they just mesh really well and they they'll take almost a a completely subservient role isn't isn't exactly what i want to say but they're, they're willing to go along with whatever the the, the director wants like what, whatever kojima wants yeah we'll do it and I'll, I'll i'll help you and it's your vision but i'm just here to just support you in any way that i can you know that sort of thing like or what, does K kojima have like a writer that's that's with him for that sort of thing i don't know because it seems like um revengeance was sort of like that but i don't think did kojima write revengeance i don't think he did did he like that was someone else but yeah i uh i don't know If, if Kojima is actually that that solo kind of kind of creator um but I, I still think that even if there are other people like moving in on that that it's it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't qualify for what we're speaking about here I I really can't speak about the Kingdom Hearts thing because I I haven't played Kingdom Hearts 3 I do agree that Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 does have a, that similar kind of like feel that it just it, it really does feel like this is someone's baby and it's just it, it's coming from this singular vision kind of kind of experience that might not actually be the case maybe it's not like that at all uh but i definitely think there's value in in those experiences and for me they're some of the most interesting experiences that you can have um it's sort of the, it comes back to the idea that i've said a few times on stream before that uh i i'm really interested in having finding niche experiences and becoming part of the niche it doesn't necessarily have to be something that I I immediately take to and I'm immediately interested in. Uh, preferably, of course, but like the niche experiences tend to be some of the best um, that you can find. It's actually how I consider my, my philosophy towards streaming has changed recently, which is that 
I consider that when you when you when you are a streamer, your job is to is to cultivate a niche, and and it might be a misuse of, of the of the word niche here. I'm not sure. Pro I don't think so. Which is that the strength of streaming is that they're like unlike. I think any other medium really like if you go and see a, a stand-up comic or you go and see a musician on stage or whatever um you can like say things to them and everything but it's really heavily discouraged you know what i mean like you're not going to have this back and forth like you can have when you're streaming so when you're streaming you are constantly having this audience interaction and no matter what the audience is what like when you have that no matter what the audience is going to shape the content and i think that's a really good thing you know um because it, it, it ends up being this like possibly the most kind of like intimate form of entertainment that there is that you can have this this back and forth where as you invest more time in a streamer and they they work on being that kind of streamer that they end up being like tailoring content to to their audience and it can end up in this position where you are you've been rewarded with this experience that you're not going to find anywhere else and that's not to say that it's better than anything you're going to find anywhere else but i just think that it's a it's a it's sort of in the same line of that and that's what a streamer should try to do they should try and make it so that you 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 can get entertainment that most people aren't going to find all that interesting or maybe even funny if it's a joke but for anyone that's a part of that audience niche it's like holy shit it's like when when we got raided that one time from rt game and they came in and they were just yelling out all these memes that like we had no idea what they were talking about like to them that was hilarious and to us it was like what the fuck is going on here you know what i mean and i i think that's 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 a really interesting and good thing you know like it's it's part of cultivating that that kind of audience interaction that you can only get here i think that you can kind of have an analog between that to what you spoke about Tarantino. Like Tarantino has, like you, you said, there was this fingerprints. I definitely agree with you there. Um, you can almost kind of feel when, even if you if you were to somehow be able to watch some of those movies uh, without even knowing that one of them was made by Tarantino, I think you could probably feel that out. You know, having watched enough of them before you get to that one. So there's some comparison there. I think that that you could think about. I agree that in general games are too big, but so are many movies and i think carantino's movies prove that you could probably do it because carantino's movies are uh probably on i don't know about film development i want to say that they're they're even bigger projects to to manage and control than than most video games but i don't know enough about film to say that for sure i'm gonna say it's it's, it's likely at least when I was a teenager, I saw saw The Ring, and that's a really normy movie to to have like be like the, the the movie that scared me the most. But in terms of my whole entire life, that probably scared me the most more than anything. But that was just because I was just really really young and and impressionable about that, and I wasn't really experienced with all, all so many horror movies. Um, but I can pretty much watch most horror movies, and I can get a little unsettled depending on what the situation is. But like they can definitely get to me way more than than games but they're still like it, it really depends on how well it's done you know especially if, if it is more toward the toward the action thing right so like movies like saw and everything i don't even really consider them to, to, to be horror and there's stuff like that's like like there's there's um like jump scares aren't really something that i that interests me much anymore if, if a movie is just about jump scares then i i i'm i don't even consider that horror even it's just it's just like it's just cheap and I'm so desensitized to stuff like zombies and everything that that that's kind of got that's kind of got to the point where I don't even consider that horror either. I would think that maybe like like Walking Dead, I can I can watch that it doesn't even phase me. People are getting ripped apart, but yet the first time I saw Shaun of the Dead and there's a character that dies uh, late into the movie, getting pulled apart from a window, and there's something about that, even though it's a comedy movie, that got to me more than almost any other zombie death. You know, like. Like th that, that really um, stuck with me. So I don't know, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, like I, I can say Saw, but I, I don't even know if, that could, if that's even a horror movie. What, what what would be my favorite for my for my bullshit criteria that I'm just making up on the spot here? I don't know. Stuff like um like the slasher movies, like Scream and and uh, anything like like Jason and Freddy Krueger or anything. It's like yeah, th th those are alright, but this, th they they seem like more fun to me, right? Haunting Hill, as we spoke about earlier, but that's not really a movie. Um, that didn't really scare me all that much, but I, I was like, I'm more like 
think it's cool like the the character designs are cool like the ghost designs i think more psychological horror gets to me more than than anything else like that like you're in like a weird situation like to me even like even though it's not really a horror movie uh there was this like kind of like a sci-fi movie called um coherence that spoke to me more as a horror movie than something like saw uh, or even Primer, like Primer to me is more of a horror movie. I, I like I like subtle, subtle horror. Yeah, I like more like more subtle horror that that's more horrific when you when you think about it, and it's kind of like oh shit, you know, like like if if I was in that situation, like like what would I do, and I would be completely fucked. I would guess the, the most overt uh, horror movie that I've seen recently, and by recently I mean it was like six years ago, was a Korean movie called Nor Roy. And I watched it, and that that pretty much creeped me out because it, it's more about it's more like a, a building dread kind of horror that explodes at at one point, and it's kind of like oh okay, like a horror that maybe only the 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 audience will recognize, and everyone uh, the characters are oblivious to it. So kind of like a dramatic irony sort of horror kind of thing. Has anyone seen Noroi? Maybe it has a Korean name that I don't know, and no one's gonna know what not what Noroi is. This is why you like Summer? Yeah, yeah, I, I really like the story in Summer. It was very, very good. Definitely a great horror experience. Is, is it Japanese? Is it not Korean? I thought for sure it was Korean. Is Train to Busan considered a horror movie? Like, I consider that more of an action movie. <laughs> I'm so desensitized to horror. Everything is like, yeah, that's, that's a... Uh... That's an action movie. My problem is that I just haven't watched a lot of movies. L let me let me tell you my darkest movie secret, okay? I haven't seen all of the Die Hards. And it was within this decade that I saw Die Hard 1 and 2 for the first time ever. That that's I I'm very ignorant of a lot of movies. I just I just never seen them. Anton1699 says, I haven't seen a single Die Hard. We got him, chat. We set him up. We got him to admit that we hadn't done it. I've seen all of them multiple times. I was kidding. It was all to get Anton6999 to admit that he hasn't seen a single one. We did it. Mission accomplished. Let's close up the, let's close up the stream. We did it. <laughs> anyway, I wouldn't consider myself a big fan of any horror movies, but I'm a fan of horror moments. Like... One of the most horrific moments in any movie that I remember recently isn't even in a horror movie. It's in Interstellar, when Matthew McConaughey comes back up from the time dilation planet. Like, that that to me is just like, oh my god. That That's just like, fuck. So it's like, those, those kind of moments are what I really, really like. I find that when a movie goes out of its way to be we are a horror movie it gets caught up in a lot of these different tropes that are very like slasher and blood and murder that sort of thing that that's what's typical stands out as, as a horror movie i think i prefer things that that have horror moments that they capitalize on an otherwise very very strong story i think that's what i prefer there probably are horror movies that do that that go out of their way to be horrific and and, and they go for that um, and I'd be interested in, in watching some of them, but I think I'm I'm a bit ignorant here. Oh, I remembered it now. We didn't watch it together. Um, some of the some of the the creepiest and and her and it's scary, horrific. All all of them is from is from the TV series Luther, because because it's so grounded. If you've seen Luther, there's there's like. There's a scene, and it does this quite quite a bit, where it does home invasions, and like it shows this character like coming home from from you know their work, and they it's late and they live alone, and they're going through like their nightly ritual and everything, and then they hear a noise and they're a little bit creeped out, and then they're like, oh, I, it, it was they check and it was nothing, it came from downstairs, they go they go downstairs, it was nothing, they go back upstairs in the room, they go to bed and they turn the light off, and then you know it's it's like a couple seconds pass, and then there's just like a guy that comes out from under the bed that's been hiding there and it's like this is a serial rapist murderer that's that's there and it's like it sounds kind of cheesy but it's it's that that idea of planning into your head you know like there, there could be someone in your house there could be someone that's that like that's doing this sort of thing you know like there and i think it was really well done in in luther um to go back to the ring i felt like the ring was really scary up until the point where they showed whatever the ghost's name is coming out of the TV set. Like, yeah. like that, that was just like, oh, okay, it's like, she looks like Gollum, I'm not scared anymore. Like, like literally, like, as I was watching that movie in the theater, I was really creeped out and scared and really on edge after the jump scare they have right in the beginning with the, with, with the, the, the scene in the closet. 
like that that really i was like oh my god and and that got to me and i was on edge for 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 most of the movie and then at the end even in the movie theater like it was it was just it was funny so but then it still stuck with me a little after that that salad fingers thing that was going on the internet for a while there's something about salad fingers that just was like nails on a chalkboard for me it, it creeped me out so much salad fingers that i just turned it off and i was like i'm not watching this anymore like salad fingers just just got something in my lizard brain that was like fuck you fuck you fuck you like I, I couldn't stand fucking salad fingers don't hug me i'm scared that didn't get to me quite as much but it gave me a similar feeling of unease yeah yeah for sure don't hug me i'm scared I, I watched only one episode of that and at the end the end montage where it starts it starts flashing different imagery like some like this eerie feeling that something is really really wrong like that i think that kind of horror really gets to me more than anything else too many cooks was really unsettling to me, despite also being pretty hilarious. Yeah, I feel that same way too. Yeah, there's there's something about like it can be happy and sing songy even anything. Just just something about like it, it almost gets into the, the Lovecraftian idea that there's like this deep lurking horror underneath all of reality and things that are that surreal, even if they're trying to be kind of happy and cheerful cheerful at the same time. Like it's it's like someone stripping a layer of protective perception away from you and you're seeing like the real horrific world that's underneath that you're ignoring the whole time you know what i mean like that's the kind of like this it just really just gets right into my head and it's just like this is just so fucking wrong and it just it just gets to me and i don't think i can i, I can think of a movie that's really really done that maybe noroi will got the closest because it's just something like really unsettling about noroi i don't know yeah, I know. So sorry to to have this completely derailed into it, but I, I guess we've we've learned that, uh, especially for the horror genre, it's difficult to to really nail what it is and and how it works. Justin, sorry about that. I like the craft of stories more than it comes to comes to speaking about like themes and symbolism and, and all that kind of stuff. That does not mean that I'm I'm never into that. Um, it's that. I'm a strong believer in the idea that you can make anything about anything if you try hard enough when it comes to themes and symbolism. Like you, you could, if you have a, it's, it's just basically a limiter of how much knowledge you have when it comes to other media. And if you really want to spend hours and hours or maybe even days, you know, at the library or reading synopsis of movies and books and everything, like you don't even have to go and watch them or, or consume the whole thing. Uh, you can make enough literary co uh, connections and references that you could make anything be about anything so it's i almost need there to be some sort of like marker by the content itself that's saying hey this is legitimate this is actually what we're doing this this is this is 100 on purpose i don't know how you can do that without it ruining like the having the you be able to interpret in any way that you that you also want to do i think that's important i think it's important that you can have things open to interpretation uh so maybe we would have to study movies that seem to have done it really really well and see how they how it is that they do it maybe it can only work when it is kind of simple and maybe that's why people don't like it maybe that's why the the the, the intellectuals don't go in for that kind of thing because they feel like it's too on the nose when i don't know i don't know if i if i agree with that hmm I understand a lot of people disagree with me when it comes to that, that anything can be about anything. Um, but I, I do really feel strongly about that. And I and I, I, I think it's probably provable too, like if you put enough time in, you know? I was kind of doing a thought exercise about Silent Hill 2 after, after we played it and I did a shit ton of research about it that, you know, like how many different ways can I interpret everything in the story, you know? Like, and I, I think I got up to five that used almost anything in the story. Uh, one of them would have made people very angry, but you know, that was kind of the point I was trying to make. Maybe I'll still do it if there's ever a video on, on Silent Hill 2. <sighs> Here's the thing though, like... I'm, I'm saying this as, as a negative right now because that's just the context that we're going through in the conversation, but it's really not. It's not a problem that you can make anything be about anything. It's just less interesting than me because you're doing all the work at that point you know as a reader or the audience you're doing the heavy lifting for whoever's in charge of the main point of the movie and while i agree that subtext is you know subtext is text you know that's 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 <laughs> the, the weird fucking saying that you know like the subtext is the most important part that's going on what isn't being said is usually 
um, the most important part of whatever story that you're that you're looking at at the moment that you're going through, um, especially with Binding Isaac, right? I I just can't get on board with with off the wall interpretations like 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 that as as being like the only way that a film can be viewed, you know, like or a book can be viewed. Like this 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 is it with with no confirmation from the people that, that wrote it this is definitely what this is about and if you disagree with this then you just haven't thought hard enough about it you know what i mean like i, I don't really like that so simple stories can definitely have hidden layers of meaning and I, I would say that if if you can get there you know like in in a reasonable way without having to like really draw from like really like how, how do you even define a stretch of something right how do you even define something that that can even be provably wrong? Like I remember when I was after. Sorry to bring up Silent Hill too. It's just the most recent memory that I that I've gone through this. Uh, you know, like I had people telling me, you know, like y you didn't even notice that every single enemy in Silent Hill Two is is female because that's an important thing about what James is going through. And it's like, yeah, but that's just that's not even true. You know what I mean? Like that's that's wrong. So I think if you can get into the point where you can you can prove some things that that that's showing that people are looking way too much into it. But does that really invalidate that that observation? Because it's interesting. So I guess it comes back to the idea that do you do you want to have like truth and and like admire deliberate story structure and, and work that has been like blatantly put into something and really get into what the writer intended do you have that that kind of experience or do you want to have art be something that's just a springboard for you to have your your own thoughts and have your own inter interpretation on them and i i kind of feel like the trap there is to say that well it has to be one or the other i don't think it has to be i think you can do both i think you can admire something for what you think that it was really setting out to do and acknowledge that and then have your cake and eat it too and go into big a, a big thought process and detail about how like okay well what can this mean to me you know what like it doesn't have to be about other media that you've consumed or whatever right like there have been plenty of times where i've i've seen a reference to something and in in and, and, and enjoy the reference of it you know like there's a callback to like um there was a time when i, I felt like uh, the walking dead was referencing fallout you know what i mean it's like okay i enjoy that but someone else that doesn't get that reference is going to be is going to be able to enjoy that too on a different level but there's also what you can personally bring to the table as well like how does this link to some experiences that you've had in your in your past and like how does maybe something speaks to you on a very deeply personal level and and that's what you get out of that content who's to say that that the interpretation is wrong even if it doesn't make 100 sense it's just to me it's it's like it's a whole different area of of, of appreciating art rather than like the craft for for lack of a better word or i don't know maybe craft is fine does that make sense i find that more intellectual people that go in for art and stuff are really into looking at art that way but you're saying that they don't do it enough in in horror in a lot of these horror movies but maybe that's because horror movies they don't get past the simple or they think it's so simple that there's no way there could be anything more there or maybe it's that those interpretations are too easy i don't think so i don't think so at the academy it's more the drama awards unless the audience yells at us to nominate it which is why mad max fury road was nominated as was black panther oh man mad max fury road should be nominated though mad max fury road was great did they yell hard enough for that Black Panther should not have been on. What the fuck was Black Panther nominated for? I watched that movie. That movie was terrible. Was that really nominated? What was it nominated for? The, the, the best the best recreation of PlayStation 1 C CGI for the final battle? Best picture. Be really? What? Hey, Joe. What's something you think that video games unnecessarily struggle at that other mediums don't? Oh man. Sorry, it's a big why, question. Why did, you read, why did you read it's that loaded, one? But I think they've asked like four times now, so. I want to say just basic writing, but I mean, I kind of feel like other mediums struggle with that too. Like, I, I feel like um, many, many movies and many TV shows get a lot of basic writing stuff wrong too, because. <sighs> Writing, writing is really difficult to to, to get prop, get done when you're collaborating because it's it's hard enough to do when you're on your own you know there's and there's also there's always the struggle of 
you just want to have things that are really interesting and cool happen but they don't necessarily always make sense and there's always a struggle of like oh man if only i could do this but you know that that contradicts the point i made earlier and it's kind of like eh. Fuck it, I'm doing it anyway. It would be really, really good. You know what I mean? Like, and that gets even worse as you get more cooks added to the broth. You know what I mean? Um, too many cooks, too many cooks. So I think that any collaborative medium is gonna suffer. Um, I think movies, especially. I think more of action movies and everything. TV. I don't really watch a lot of bad TV now, so maybe maybe that's why. Whereas I watch, I want, I'm more, way more willing to watch bad movies than I am to watch bad TV. Because when a movie is badly written, it still usually has really good action, and that's what I like to see in these these types of movies. So, um, I guess it is in TV. I'm not sure about this point. It's just the fundamental structure of every single video game is an action movie because an action movie needs to be built with the intent of, of facilitating action scenes you know that sounds like yeah duh but it, it's it's true you know what i mean like it, you have to have the action scenes to for it to be an action movie and to have that you need to have an excuse for characters to, to fight you know whether they're in giant robots fighting aliens or they are fighting each other or it's a like a like a, big, a lot of shootouts or or it's a sport movie about boxing you know what i mean like it's a, a bunch of stuff no, probably not really about the boxing i, I don't know if, if the boxing movie is really about the fights themselves i haven't seen the new rockies and everything so maybe not uh, it's more about like the the perseverance and determination there uh but you know what i mean like a typical action movie like it needs to have a story excuse for these fights to happen and that's what pretty much every single video game needs too it needs these excuses for for combat to happen and i think that's when you end up with these way more creative settings uh, like in Persona where they're trying to find new ways to have combat happen without having to have the, the typical combat kind of like invading aliens bullshit tropes you know what I mean um, and because of that you get a lot of stories that end up being very samey and don't make all that sense or kind of dumb because they need to have the combat to happen you know like it's difficult to justify, you know, having characters be able to be talked out of conflict and they sit down and have, you know, a moral debate or a philosophical discussion about something when having that option be presented to the player destroys quite possibly hundreds, maybe even th thousands of hours of work that went into a boss battle that now that that player isn't going to see, you know? so. I would say that video games struggle with that. I don't think video games struggle with visuals. I don't think they struggle with cinematography, although somewhat. Um, all right, let's get to the first first Witcher reference of the night. I feel like Witcher 3 gets gets its proverbial dick sucked quite a lot for being very cinematic and having really great camera angles and a lot of discussions and, and, uh, and uh, dialogue scenes. And I feel like that's kind of like, it's good. Like it really adds a lot to it, but like, is that really worthy of a whole lot of praise? Because I feel like there's quite a lot of other games that do that well, but they just aren't gigantic 100 hour uh, RPGs, right? So, I mean, I kind of feel like this is, this should be basic level expectations here, but because typical, typically big long games like that just have two characters thrown with just head cams on each one as they take turns to talk to each other it's like oh my god it's so good and it is good it adds a lot but yeah i guess that's just an issue of the era that we're in with these rpg kind of things i'm not sure but yeah so i would say somewhat cinematography mostly writing but i i'm cheating because i kind of feel like other mediums struggle with that too writing is just so difficult good writing is a miracle sometimes yeah i kind of feel like i kind of feel like a lot of it is accidental i kind of feel like the way that S Stephen King writes is how a lot of writers write, but they just don't admit it, which is that they just throw an immense amount of crap at the wall and see what sticks, because Stephen King has a lot of bad stories, especially endings. They're terrible. Um, but when he gets something good, it's really good. So I, I kind of feel like he's just more honest about how much he ends up writing and he just is like, fuck it, I'm gonna publish it and see what happens. Like maybe he had uh, an experience one time where he thought something was kind of shit. Actually, I know he had this kind of experience because it was kind of shit. I'm not the biggest Stephen King fan, by the way. I just, he's one of the one of the authors, I think Lily would agree with me here. He's one of the authors that's quite, um, quite forthcoming with details about the writing process. You know what I mean? A lot of writers are like, yeah, this took me 15 years to write and you know, it went through 150 different drafts and 5,000 edits. And I'm only exaggerating just a little bit here with, with the things that some writers say about their work, you know? And you know, and, and this is how much time it went into and you know, 
please, please, please think that, you know, this, this, everything was carefully well thought out and there was, you know, that, that sort of thing. Whereas Stephen King is just kind of like, yeah, I wrote this and I thought it was shit and I put it in the trash. And if my wife hadn't picked it out yeah, of the trash, no one, was, no one would have ever read it. I think it was Carrie, it was wasn't Carrie. it? Yeah. Like, so I guess he's, he's just more of like, fuck it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna publish it and see what happens, you know? And if it's bad, it's bad. If it's great, that's it's great. that's my favorite of all of his, uh the books of his that I have read. So yeah. see if, if Tabitha hadn't fished out of the garbage, then I never would have, I never would have read it. So there you go. So I do wonder if it's, if there's something there about, um, about just like, fuck it. We're just, we're, it's, it's just a, a happy accident when everything comes together, you know, especially if you don't do a lot of planning. Even with a lot of planning, a lot of things become happy accidents. Um, or you want to do something really bad like there's the, at the end at the end of um at the end of uh the third i've i have a series called the bounty hunter and at the end of series three of the bounty hunter um i w i was writing the scene that i had planned for for like i think two years and i was really enjoyed writing it and at the very very end of writing that scene a character that was that was supposed to survive something I, I was reading the scene back to myself and I was like, I should really kill him right now. Like if, if I killed him, like it would be, this would be a really strong scene and it would be, it's fitting. It's a, it's a good death for this character. And I, I should really kill this guy right now, but he's my main character. You know, like it, it, it's, it's going, it's going to, it's going to just destroy like two, like 200 to maybe 300,000 words of more planning that I have after this. But like, I, I really wanted to kill him because it would it would have fit and I was like fuck um, and uh, you know spoilers for my own work I, I chickened out and I didn't do it and I and I really wonder sometimes if maybe I should have done it you know there was there was a way I could have made it work maybe but like I had all this planning that that was that was there and I didn't realize when I got there how how good of a death that would have been for that character I'm like huh. I, I really should have killed him maybe and I don't know if that was a mistake or not so even when you have a lot of planning there are um, there there are moments like that that can come and, and kind of surprise you I had a similar experience with one of mine did you that I hadn't I hadn't planned it I hadn't accounted for it but at the end of the book it just seemed natural that this person would, would, would like go down a different path and and wouldn't survive it and I hadn't planned on killing them off and I hadn't planned on them being like a villain, you know, and they became a villain mm -hmm. because it just felt more natural. And I was, I kind of had a big aha moment of like, I and didn't plan on killing you. So sorry, but you know, you have to die, you know, like, but isn't that when it you, just when you more think sense. Yeah, I, I, it all kind of came together and it was just like, I want to say that's when things are usually quite good about writing and that's when you end up reading something back and you're like wow this 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 is really good but then I just wonder if it's if it's more about like it just feels good to write it so there's like there's a certain amount of uh like catharsis that's happening when when you're doing it and it just kind of like it's sort of like a, a dopamine rush that you're doing it and it's not really as good as you think it is I'm not sure but if, my stories if it are is... different though too because I didn't have a whole bunch of planned more after that like mine was a one-off book you know mine was not a series so but if it is true that 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 is when the writing is at its best then that that goes to show you that it is about just like just writing and just throwing shit to the wall and it's gonna be a lot of trash that you throw out that uh Stephen King doesn't so yeah and video games seem to seem to lend some credence to that because uh, video games are so difficult to make and so difficult to edit, probably more so than any other medium, that uh, when you want to make changes like that and respond to them, you know, like you make a change on page 200, well, if you want, you can go back and change every single other page before that, and all you have to do is change some words, whereas, you know, in, in a movie it's difficult, but in a game it's even worse, because now there's like so many different assets that need to change, and you might have to, to start the whole game over from scratch, so I think this is like a lot of planning that needs to go into, uh, into, into game dev when it comes to stories, which is, which is also bad, because a lot of game dev is, is more about like, can we even do this? We're not sure. Well, let's see if we can get a prototype working and figure it out, and then and then after that sense, like, okay, well, now we need to plan. You know what I mean? It's, it's a bit difficult. But yeah, you don't plan as much. No, I don't. I hadn't planned for that. But I got there and then I was like... 
I think it turned out a little bit more intense than I had planned it was going to be. And it just felt like a more natural next step for the character that this would happen. You know, that they were they were on like a self-destructive path that they couldn't get off of, you know, and like this is what's going to happen. But I didn't plan for it to be that much, you know, like I that just came out in the in the scenes around the stuff I had planned, this character was just kind of deteriorating, you know? And it was really interesting to me to get to the end. And that was the first like big novel I'd ever written too, right? So like, mm -hmm. it was really something for me to have that kind of moment at the end of, oh my gosh, the killer is, is you know, like, yeah, she's you, the killer. So <laughs> you, know, like, you got to write by reading, yeah. But I had planned, but I didn't, I didn't stick with it. Like it didn't feel right when I got there. So I guess sometimes maybe you plan, but it, you can plan whatever you want at the beginning, but sometimes when you get there, it just doesn't feel right. I don't know. Did that ever happen to you? Yeah, it's just I, I just don't know if it's if it's because it's cathartic or not, or if it's because of uh, because it is legitimately a good idea. I'm not sure. I would argue it's harder in movies because if if you want to reshoot a new scene or reshoot one, you have to gain every actor and match their exact appearance, despite probably months and weeks having passed. Okay, so movies aren't always shot in order, right? So you can change things on the fly, or maybe you can do things in a specific order just to feel things out if you have that much planning. But then that's just planning with extra steps, right? And you can make sure you can make the changes before shooting is over too. It, 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 it's gonna depend on the kind of movie it's you're, you're making. If it's something like. Avengers then yeah, okay, like there's no way it's, it's just way too expensive, but with a game It doesn't matter what you do, you know So I, th I think some movies are gonna be way more difficult, but in general games are gonna be worse But I've never made a game or a movie so I'm speaking out of ignorance here What are your thoughts on, you. on spoiler culture? It seems to be very pervasive now, especially on social media I've read about some research that was done that showed that overall people actually enjoy stories more if they were spoiled beforehand, even when they said before the experiment that spoilers ruin the experience for them. This could differ between people, and as far as I know, the amount of research done on it is very low. But I think it's interesting that this goes against how so many people behave regarding spoilers. So the reason I'm laughing is because this is this is like I think one of two questions so far tonight that uh, someone asked in 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 chat during the Code Vein streams and we were talking about it. Uh, I think over multiple streams actually. Uh, so my thoughts on this are, are quite complicated because I think it is a complicated topic. I have also heard of the same same study that you are referencing, although it might be a, a, a similar study, not the exact same one. Uh, I think I also heard it. Um, I'm not sure if it's Japan or China that trailers over there have um, have spoilers in them because their audience, the audience over there doesn't care and they prefer to know the big moment going in and it doesn't really hamper their enjoyment whatsoever. Uh, so maybe that's where I'm getting that information from. Um, and we didn't talk about that, like may maybe knowing spoilers, it makes, makes something better going in. Um, I'm of the mind that you shouldn't go in, that you, it depends on what the creator wants you to know. And the first time you experience any media, uh, in general, you should try to go in and, and meet it on, you know, either meet it halfway uh, if you can't exactly meet it on the, its own terms, you should try to meet it halfway. Uh, there are exceptions to that, especially in video games. Like, I don't think you should have to, like, if you're playing Fatal Frame, I don't think you should have to role play as as a young girl in order to be scared. You know what I mean? Like, there there are some some areas that I don't think you should have to do that. And role playing in video games is one of those ones that's kind of difficult to nail down actually it's surprisingly so so i don't i i don't know exactly where i would draw the line for that or if there should be one drawn but uh we don't have to talk about just video games we can talk about other things too i think that you should try and go into it but if you have learned on your own that you don't particularly need to go in blind then go for it you know like while i do believe that you can experience content wrong like you can play a game wrong you can watch a movie wrong by not paying attention to it you can you can read a book wrong by by skimming paragraphs and and skipping pages you know what i mean like it's it's very easy you know i i don't even think that you could argue that you know against it you know once you get to those extreme cases you know like you can definitely experience media in a wrong way it's only wrong if it diminishes the experience for you. You know what I mean? Like if you're watching a movie and for whatever reason the movie isn't all that great, but it's it's good enough, 
that you still want to have it on the background while you're checking your phone, talking to your friends, or just having a discussion in, with a group in, in the room with you or something, you know, or you're, you're not even, it's just a movie you put on the background just to get buzzed, you know, whatever it is that you like to do to get buzzed, then there's nothing wrong with that and that's fine. It's only when you are experiencing something in, in the quote unquote wrong way that it diminishes the experience that it could be considered wrong, you know, that's, that's what I think. I think that's an important distinction to make because I think it's easy to forget that, you know? But when it comes to specifically story spoilers, I, I really can't agree because that's the kind of person I am. I like to be surprised. I like to go in with low expectations because usually expectations lead me to be quite annoyed. And sometimes I like to guess the twist before it happens. It's like a, a puzzle that I'm, that I'm watching, you know, like, can I predict it? And that used to be a, a really fun game for me when I was younger, but I've tried to get out of that now and I've tried to just experience things as they are and not try to guess that because it would kind of diminish some some of the fun for me from from media but you can still see it happen sometimes on streams where you know i will just just off the cuff predict something that comes true in the game because i just have so much experience trying to guess those things i'm not always right you know and sometimes they are complete shots in the dark and i think it's easy to forget the times that i've said something and it turned out to be wrong because it's like oh okay you know like it's not memorable but then when it happens to be true it's it's hilarious so um, yeah, it's, I think I have more fun trying to guess what characters are going to say now because I'm noticing that as we become more of a global culture and there's so much art that we consume, probably far more than any other generation, right? Uh, that a lot of dialogue and like, like speech that happens in certain moments in, in, um, media that, uh, is, is something that, that's repeated multiple times over, over different things, like the big confrontation moment and, you know, uh, who are you doing this for? It's like, I'm doing it for me. You know what I mean? Like it's that sort of thing. Like these things are coming back like up again and again. And, and you know, it's not just references. I think it's just sort of like it's getting stuck in the communal kind of hive mind that we are. It's like, it's interesting to think of Twitter like that, that uh, Twitter and social media in general is becoming like the representation of our entire culture. And whenever something gets picked up and gets and gets like promoted heavily by not just the algorithm, but just like, like a lot of likes and retweets. It's like events happen every single every single day, and these are the voices out of the communal hive mind that we have decided represent our views the most, and we're gonna like and retweet it and like it the most. I think uh, I think Nick just got one of those. He he did a tweet about Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga was like there were two tweets about Lady Gaga. She was playing Bayonetta. And then there was another tweet she said later, what's Fortnite? And uh, Nick tweeted out the, those two images of, of Lady Gaga and, uh, saying those two things. And that went like got like mega tweets and retweets and, and, and stuff. I kind of view that as like this communal gathering of consciousness and, and everything that's going on with, with our society now. And it's, kind of, it's interesting, but it's also kind of creepy. But yeah, so I, I kind of feel, I kind of see the same thing that's happening in, in media now where there are lines of dialogue and and uh, that people use in similar situations when it comes to, to, to certain stories. Maybe it's because just art is kind of stuck in a rut or something, I don't know. Maybe there's just too much TV being produced at the moment or too, too, too many movies, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm also, I also kind of kind of have like this, this pet theory that a lot of people that have, that have grown up in this era kind of like to pretend that they're in a movie of their own and they like, like when something happens to themselves, they might even think, you know, oh, this is like that part in the movie or what would a character say whether they're in their situation? And they would even say the line of dialogue that they think is, is, you know, you know, is there, you know, like something really bad happens to them and they kind of look at the imaginary camera and go fucking typical. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I can see that happening. There's a line in Gone Girl like that. Do you remember that? Yeah. I uh, thought that was a really, that... really strong yeah that that's that's sort of what it like confirmed like i i've been thinking about that for a while and then i read that i was like oh okay cool this is this is a thing yeah that made me, that made me think that maybe there was there was something onto that yeah um what was the question <laughs> Spoiler, Spoiler culture. There we go. Sorry, I got. I went on a. I went on a little journey there when it when it comes to uh, to answering about writing in general. But yeah, I, I think that um, if if you've learned from your from yourself, like everyone's been spoiled on something. Maybe it even happened during the stream on about a really good anime. Uh, everyone's been spoiled about something. So maybe you you found out about yourself that sorry, Kate is sucking her fingers really hard. Uh, maybe you found out about yourself that you don't you don't care about spoilers. I'm I'm noticing lately, and this is a really bad habit, and. I 
almost tweeted about this. Maybe I still will. Maybe anyone else is out there is going through the same thing. I've noticed that as I get older, I'm I'm less interested in in um, in watching movies than I am like if I'm only just a little interested in the movie, I'll just read the plot synopsis on Wikipedia. Does, is anyone else doing that? Is that just a thing like in as you get older, it's just like, you know what, I just can't be fucked unless I know it's gonna be good, you know, like, so this is the duality of man here, I prefer to go in blind, but if I'm not really, really interested in something, like, if I'm only just, like, a little interested, I'm like, eh, I don't know, I'll just read the plot synopsis, and if it's really interesting, I'll stop halfway through, but sometimes I'll just read the whole thing, and I'll just be like, wow, that would have been shit, I'm glad I didn't watch that, you know what I mean, like, there's been a lot of movies that I haven't watched now because of that, because I just read that, and I'm like, yeah, this would have been bad, and that's probably a really bad habit, because it's not fair, but um, I'm noticing a lot of a lot of movies in particular, and in particular a lot of horror movies. When I look up their synopsis online, um, also a lot of um, like concept sci-fi movies. A little a little bit like Primer, but Primer is an example of it done well. They don't they don't end like they just stop. The, do you guys understand what I'm saying there? Like it's not like oh we we're building up to this conclusion. It's just. We're just gonna talk about, we're just gonna explore this for a while, and then we're just gonna stop the movie. And it's like, wait, what? Like, w w what about this? What about that? No, you're just supposed to think about it, and it's just supposed to linger in your head for a while after this. It's like, oh, okay, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, it's, and I don't really like that. I like there to be a conclusion. It can be an open-ended conclusion. It can still be like, oh, okay, cool. This is, this is concluding, but it's leaving me something to think about. But like a lot of the, all of these movies, they just, they just stop. And I don't really enjoy that, but yeah. So there's the duality of Joe, who really, really wants to to, to go into to movies knowing as little as possible. Um, doesn't like spoilers, but at the same time, if if the the media only looks just a little interesting, we'll just read the whole thing instead of having to to sit down. Maybe it's maybe it's age, maybe it's time, or maybe it's just maybe it's just like how much how much media there is now. It's like I only want to watch the really really good stuff and. Even like shows that you think or movies you think are going to be like a shoe in end up being like disappointing overall. Like, I was really into Game of Thrones, and now it's like, okay, well, do I even want to finish? Because everyone said it was really, really bad, you know. Like, um, Star Wars is something that I was never really into, but I thought that was kind of like a safe bet to have like an entertaining time at least. And it turns out, like, okay, actually, no, you know what I mean? Like, so it's it's hard to know what's worth the time lately. Well, and you'll never watch it all. So if you choose one and yeah. it's bad, you could have watched something else that was good and you missed out on that. Yeah, like as as the greatest song of our generation says, there's there's more to see that can never be seen, more to do than it can ever be done, right? It's the circle of life. Oh. Yeah, so it's it's well, that. You say it like that. Yeah, so I I I uh, I don't know what's what's the the correct response, but. Yeah, I can definitely acknowledge and even agree that there is the possibility that spoilers are overvalued. Going into a story without knowing the big details are overvalued. Like most people go into the big classics and they know the ending, you know? Like most people who go into Shakespeare know the ending to Shakespeare. But I kind of want to say that they're, they're, that that's kind of different than, than some media that aren't built around like big reveals and stuff, you know? Like I do agree with the idea that if if a um, if a story needs the twist to work, then in most cases it probably wasn't even a good story. You know, you you want the the twist to if, even if it does work like that, you want the twist or the big reveal. Like it doesn't have to be a twist. You want the big reveal to be something that uh, changes the whole story, so it, it even uh, like enhances a a second time that you're watching or reading. You know, like you, you want that to to be. Um, how the the reveal works but i do think there are s some stories that can work with that with that big reveal that they they're not going to be considered like um great giant art you know it's not going to last in the test of time of like someone like shakespeare but at the same time I, I do think that there is something to be said about something that's just just aims to be entertaining with that um big reveal i'm thinking of like something like saw i don't know why i've been thinking of saw a little bit more lately maybe it's because people want me to play uh 9999 uh, that was too many nines, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. Like maybe, maybe if I, if I risked it and tried to spoil myself on a bunch of really good movies and then watch them, I, I wonder if I would still enjoy them all that much. I don't know. I don't know. I think my favorite movies with big reveals are, are usually they, they still survive it. But would I still enjoy them as much? You know, like th those are really powerful. Like like grab you moments like they they really pull you in hmm. 
Depends on, yeah, as always, it's gonna depend, right? It's always gonna depend. I wonder if it works the other way too, like, if you know, if you know the ending, and you know, like, where a story is going, could that be like, I wonder if like, if it doesn't end well, will that make you enjoy it more because you don't have these expectations going in and it's like, okay, I know where this is going. I know that I don't have to get my hopes up that this is going to turn out great. I can just relax and enjoy it. Or I wonder if it's like, it can make it, make it worse too. It's like, oh, this, these are a bunch of really great details and, and uh, it's, it's, I really hope that this ends well. And then if you know the spoiler, like, yeah, it doesn't. Hmm, I wonder about that. Think, thinking about Witcher again, you know, you know how it is. Thinking about Witcher might delete later. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I think that's all I can say. How do you deal with the pressure to experience more things than you have time for? Games, movies, books, etc. This is something <laughs> I think about a lot, and I'm sure in your position, people have asked you about far more games than you have the time to play. As much as it seems unimportant, as it's just supposed to be entertainment, this can be stressful at times. I feel like people are probably exposed to this a lot more now because of the amount of information you get from the internet on a daily basis. And it can feel like people around you are doing a lot more than you are, when in reality it's probably because of seeing a huge amount of different people talking about things they've done. But I think what you're talking about uh, has a term, right? It's called, uh, it's abbreviated to FOMO, which is fear of missing out and everyone's experiencing all this great stuff and you're like, well, I'm not experiencing it. and. Um, like I feel like I'm gonna miss out on on being able to to watch like the Marvel movies like like uh, blind and it makes me wonder if, if that's why I don't like the Marvel movies as much as other people because um, most of the time those big revelation moments are spoiled like the day of you know like um, I think the end game was spoiled for me uh, I think it took a month or maybe two weeks uh, before end game was spoiled for me whereas Game of Thrones is spoiled while the episode is, is still on air, you know, like before the episode's over because it just it's just all over Twitter and unfortunately I, I can't not go on Twitter for as long as that's gonna be the Twitter bomb, you know what I mean? It's gonna it's gonna be all over the place. Although maybe not, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I could just uh not go on there. Eh, I guess so. I picked up a heart by the way, so I'm just picking up the other hearts now. I think I picked up a great heart by accident. Um yeah, so it's fear, fear, fear of missing out. So what I spoke about in the last answer was, was is really related to this, which is like there's so much media now that I, I tend to just read plot synopsis on, on some things that I don't think I'm all that interested in. Um, and I don't think this is a, a good thing. I don't think I would recommend it, but uh, maybe it is a good thing ultimately. Maybe I should, I should uh, see how it goes like maybe it, it isn't bad considering how much there is i think a good way of getting past this is having um a a network of people that have similar tastes to you or have the opposite tastes to you it's like um it's something that a lot of people say that they they disagree with me on almost everything and it's like okay cool if, if you disagree with me on almost everything then i'm one of the most valuable sources of, of criticism that there is because if i like something you should never play it and if i don't like something you should play it right like if you disagree that strongly um so it's like it's just a resource for you um so anyone that's like that that you you can find is is a really really good thing uh but i think the best way to do that is is friends not critics or anything like that so if you have a friend that you agree with often or you disagree with often i think that's, that's a really you should count yourself very lucky to have that resource available to you uh, because there is way too much there's, there's way too many books coming out there's way too many movies there's way too many tv shows if you it depends on what kind of movies you're into though if you're into a lot of um just like the really high like blockbuster movies then you could probably comfortably watch everything that comes out every single year but if you're into like a lot of indie films and a lot of foreign films or almost anything really like if if, if you're like a big movie buff then yeah it's going to be really difficult for you to find out what you uh what you should watch and what you shouldn't and the same kind of goes for for video games right like video game players like are you going to be are you only playing the big releases that come out because there's a lot of people that only do that and if they do like they probably just have barely enough time through the year to just play the big releases and that's it or are you someone that likes to experiment with a lot of indie games and and experimental games and and you're into a lot of different genres then yeah then you're gonna have to have some support network that uh will help you able to identify which games that you should definitely be playing there's a lot of pressure to even watch a lot of stuff you know like it's not just about games either. It's also about movies and, and, and books, you know, like video games are 
unfortunately or fortunately, they have almost every single part of, of all the art that we have created as a species so far, right? They have music, they have visuals, they have storytelling, they have cinematography, you know, most of them anyway, you know, like there are, there are some exceptions, but like, like video games are just, just everything, you know, that's why some people think that they're the highest form of art. I would say that that's not true. I think that just because it, it, it is the most complex doesn't make it the highest, no, like no fucking way. There's, there's something romantic about the simplicity of other, of other mediums for sure. But yeah, so you end up in the situation where it's like okay so if you want to talk about games you are also going to be drawn into discussions about movies you're also going to be just drawn into discussions about writing you're also going to be discussions about cinematography and 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 music and and, and everything really because it's just i, I don't know is, is there anything any form of like broad form of art that isn't isn't contributed in in um in video games like i guess i guess dance but i know very little about dance like but then there's bosses that dance, right? Like our favorite from Code Vein. Like, I don't know, like I, I, I think that there is this pressure and, a, I, and because of that, I feel that there are a lot of people that end up coming on the streams, especially that sometimes in these Q and A's, that end up asking me like, hey, have you read this? Have you watched that? Have you played this? Um, what Do you like this music? It's just this really, and it, it could be just be that people are just interested in just in general taste. Like most of our discussions in modern society are just about the media that we consume. And that's just how it is. And whether that's a good thing or, you know, uh, um, a brave new world nightmare I'm not sure but like let's a discussion for another time but yeah I kind of feel like there is more pressure because everything can be related back to video games and you should be thinking about it and I feel bad because most of the time when people ask me hey have you watched this I say no animation is another one too right like I'm not talking about anime like an animated films and everything and, and tv shows like a lot of games are animated so it's not even just live action live action has a cinematography and um, is it still cinematography when it's animated? I'm gonna say yes. Like a lot of animated shows now simulate a camera, right? So I'm guessing yes, it still counts as cinematography, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, I feel like there's a lot of pressure and um, I'm gonna be maybe a little too honest with you guys. Sometimes it gets really annoying. Like when it's it's the you know the same question over and over again like have you seen this have you have you played this have you done that like i try not to let it annoy me because it's it's annoying in a way that it, it's not the person's fault like at all like they shouldn't feel bad but it does get annoying to answer the same thing over and over and over again i think usually maybe after five times it's uh it gets to the point where it's kind of like i'm i'm a little i'm a little tired of answering this question and then i, I start to wonder if people are asking it more because they they kind of want to like badger you into it you know what i mean like i can appreciate that and it's really flattering it's like hey i really want you to experience this piece of media so i can know your opinions on it and we can talk about it or you just really like something and you just want to share that experience right like i want to do that with some people when it comes to different media but like i just just want to be honest like sometimes it can get really annoying if you think you are one of those people, don't feel bad. Like, it's fine. It's just just me being a little too honest, I guess. It's not about just, like, gathering information. It's also about understanding references that people say. Uh, understanding references that people say in, in like, their, their YouTube videos that they make that I like to watch. And I like to understand the point, you know? Like, it's also really important to have a lot of references and, and, and things, not just for jokes, although like I kinda I kinda don't like a lot of referential humor because a lot of referential humor and this is you know a little bit hypocritical because sometimes I make referential humor, uh, but I try to make my referential humor is usually about our own inside jokes, which I kinda feel like are like that's way more allowed than just hey I referenced Die Hard or something. I kinda feel like a lot of referential humor is just haha I referenced a thing, you know? Like if it's used in a in a transformative way to uh, use some cop YouTube copyright lingo, then I appreciate it a lot more. But when it's just, hey, I said a line from a movie, haha, -ha, you know, like, um, it's, it's, isn't it funny? And it's fine in, in, in everyday conversation. Like that's like, it's not just like, oh, it's, it's tolerable. Like it can be funny, you know, like, you know, you're just having a quick live back and forth with, with someone like that's, that's fine. But when it's in like a video or something, it's kind of like, oh, you know, I wish there was more to it than that. Um, so I'm not really just a fan of references for, for, uh, the reference sake itself. Um, but it's important to know those 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 references so you understand it when people make it, but also so you can um, reference things in an academic way, which is like this this experience is like this, or uh, sometimes a there won't be a reference, but it'll be homage, and you need to understand what that is, you know? Um, as as meme as it is right now, um, there was that, that tweet that was going on that, that showed like a shot from the Dark Knight Rises and the new Joker movie. And 
it uh it showed like hey in case in case you missed it you know like this when they're side by side this really really obvious kind of kind of thing that um is so obvious and so easy to do that it might not even be intentional because it might be just some stupid fucking thing that people are seeing in, in, into it but it's like yeah um where, where joker's in the taxi in both the, the dark knight rises and uh in the new joker movie so it's it's like that like so you can recognize those sorts of things but also so you can draw those comparisons yourself and uh sometimes it's it can be seen as a as an easy way out like i remember uh shammy had a challenge for himself that uh in his surge video he wasn't allowed to mention dark souls he specifically made himself have that challenge and i thought that was really brave of him you know like i'm not gonna say it um and because it can be such such an easy way out to just be like hey it's like this and that's it that's all you have to say um and i i, I think that that's that's true like sometimes it can be really easy to to reference things but um video games suffer from it a little more i think because um, video games are just so complicated and are hard to explain uh, through the written word that uh, it can be, it, it's just really efficient to just say it's like this other thing if you've played it, you know? Is there anything you want to add to that? About, do you ever feel like you're you're missing out? All the time. All the, all the time? Constantly. With with movies or books or all media? The, the books especially makes me feel a little self-conscious. Oh, can I can I ask you a question before you get into that? Yeah. Are are you do you ever feel that you're missing out with video games? Yeah. But it's more one of those things to, have you ever had something that you wish that you had more of an interest in? You wished it was more part of your personality or you wished it was more part of your character? Yeah, sure. I had friends that I worked with and stuff who were more into video games and stuff and they would talk about it and I always felt kind of left out and now I'm part of this community so I constantly feel left out so it's um it's something though that when I do play video games I get frustrated and I I, I don't want to die repeatedly and I don't want to try over and over again as soon as it gets hard I want to walk away from it so I wish I was a different type of person because then I think I would enjoy video games more. Instead, I want to enjoy them more than I actually do. I just, as soon as it gets tough, I want to throw my hands up and say, fuck this, I'm done. Like even playing Stardew with Finn, like we went to the desert and I got I got trashed a few times there. And after like the third time I said to him, um, I need a break, I need to turn it off and walk away. Like I'm, I'm getting mad, Shit, sorry. You know? I'm getting frustrated, you know? I, I, at that you know even with him there i was getting frustrated i didn't want him to see me getting frustrated so i was like we're, we're done for now we'll, we'll go and, and you know hang out and you know on the farm for a while you know until i i calm down and i can come back and we haven't gone back you know it's just i'm just not i don't think i'm just a video game person that's all uh there's there's a video i think we're gonna reference later another question that was like i think i spoke about this i told you about this already uh rasputin made a video that, that like went like like mega viral it's got like over four million views right now and it's about uh his wife learning how to play games i think we, you should uh you should watch it i think you get something out of it um but it's an interesting it's an interesting question that you said interesting point you say that you, you're not into like the adversity of games because i th i think like as as an art form video games are all about adversity like that's what so like if you were to look at <clears throat> like the 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 emotional core that's in every art like a piece of art or every art artistic media i think that games are definitely art but is gameplay art and i think that gameplay is is like can make you experience something, um, you know, like Shadow of the Colossus can make you experience something profound, you know, like Undertale can make you experience something profound. There's a lot of, there's not a lot of games that can do that through gameplay, but they do exist. But I think that if you're looking at like every game is an art form that like all gameplay is art. I think game gameplay is like the artistic expression of, of adversity, of of overcoming challenge, of like going up against something and just being and just being conquering it and just being like, you know, fuck you, I did it. And the fact that you like you find that frustrating and, you, and, you, and you're resistant to it might be that um, it, games aren't for you, but also might be that you just weren't exposed to it. Um, uh, early on enough, I don't I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I find that if a game isn't challenging me, I it better be doing something really interesting. 
And if it isn't, then I'm I'm bored and I don't want to do it. Like I really want to be challenged. And now I go out of my way to find that challenge. You know, I I almost every single game, um, not this one though, but almost every single game, I, I go in with my own set of arbitrary rules now. It kind of pisses chat off sometimes. It pisses some people to watch the videos off too. Like, but that's that's how I enjoy the games now, is that I have to go in with like my own uh, arbitrary restrictions or or what's the opposite of a of, of a handicap? I'm not sure. Like I, I have to go in and, and 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 do that, but like you're like not that at all. So I wonder why. I wonder if it's just the personality type or because you just weren't exposed to games soon enough. Well I was exposed to them kind of, but not not like that. More from a spectator point of view. Mm -hmm. I, I would see my parents play them, but like I wasn't wasn't really you know invited to join in right so maybe that's what it is maybe maybe I didn't play enough maybe I didn't play from young enough I don't know but maybe I'm not patient enough I just I feel like um, a lot of you you uh, gamer people are more resilient and uh, gamers please yeah. gamers you know people who play video games right and you're more resilient and you're more I want to say you're more patient and that you can take hits over and over again and you Ooh. can keep going back over and over again and like i've seen you play the games when you do the videos and i've seen you play games when you don't have to do videos before the channel when you used to play and you still would go back over and over again and you would go at it until you got it yeah whereas i would have said fuck this shit and walked away and slammed the <coughs> controller down like and never touched it again and that's usually what happens like i i just i get mad and i wish i wasn't like that and I keep trying, but I think that's just, it's a quality that you, you guys have that you enjoy getting kicked and, and you enjoy the whole, I'm rising and I'm coming back and I know I beat the shit out of you and I won, you know? And whereas I'm still like, you kicked me, like, get mad, get how mad. dare you kick me? Like, I just, I, I don't know. Okay. So, so there's something interesting in chat right now that someone said, um, Interestingly enough, I play games and I play competitive games, but I have a hard time handling adversity in player versus environment AI situations. I played games when I was young, uh, but I've always been like this. I dropped Ocarina of Time when I was younger and only beat it when I was much when I was much earlier, older, I think. It was simply because I was uncomfortable confronting these challenges. So, that, so that's um, interesting that it's when it's against a person, it's it's different. So I guess when it's a person, it's more about it's it's more like a sport because there is definitely a comparison you can make between you can make between sports and um, and games for sure like they're both they're both they're both considered games so it makes sense <clears throat> can I bomb these two like I bomb the guy but it's something that I wish I I had you know it was something that I wish I was good at and it's something that I wish that that I could understand what the hell you guys are talking about all the time because I have no idea half the time what anyone is even talking about and you know um, it's kind of on the list with playing piano and learning how to paint, you know, mm -hmm. like it would be like on the same list as learning a language. Like it's, it's video games are on the same list for me as, as those other things that you would learn, you know, to learn them. But what I was going to say was I feel bad. I feel almost inferior when people say, oh, you write books. Well, have you read this one? Yeah. Have you read that I'm, one? I'm the exact same way. Yeah. I and did. I'm like, no, no. Oh, you really should. It's the genre you write. Oh, well, I haven't, I haven't read them. Oh, well, you went to school for English and okay, I didn't graduate, but you, I took English courses in university. I took history. Oh, you went to school for this? Oh, I'm in school right now and we're reading these books. Have you read them? And it's like, they're classics that like I probably should have read. Had I stuck with the program, I would have I would have gotten to them eventually, right? But no, I haven't read them, you know? And it's it's less so for movies because I can just kind of say, well, I guess I'm just not that into movies that I haven't seen this really classic movie or I haven't seen all of this really classic movie. I've seen parts of it on when it was on TV, but I never committed to it. But when it's books, it's a little bit more personal for me. And it makes me feel kind of like, well, I must not be that great of a writer or I must not be as smart as you because I haven't read those books. And I, you know, like my writing must not be, I haven't read every Agatha Christie's. So therefore I must not be, you know, anywhere near on track to being an Agatha Christie, right? Because, you know, like I haven't, I haven't even read her books. So 
No, I, I definitely feel the same way. Uh, you shouldn't feel that way though. It's like I, I'm, I'm telling you not to feel that way, even though I often feel that way myself. I was, I was kind of embarrassed when, uh, when we were playing Danganronpa V3, um, because we were playing Danganronpa V3. Now because, uh, because the, the people were like, you know, you, I, I didn't like what happened in the first trial. If to put it mildly, if you, you know what I'm talking about, but <clears throat> like I don't want to spoil it. And then people. We're like Agatha Christie does this in one of her books, you know. Like, haven't haven't you read that? Like, are you saying that Agatha Christie is is, is a bad writer? And I'm kind of like, well, I haven't read that, so I don't know. But if she did it and she did it poorly, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like I I have since read read a bit more Agatha Christie, and I I think I even might have read the book that Dangarampa was was uh, you know based on, and. That book's kind of shit, you know. Like, uh, and then there were none, you know. Like, it it was it was an interesting premise, but it was like, this was kind of shit, you know. What I mean, like, yeah, just because they're big classics doesn't mean you can't criticize them. But yeah, I, I definitely feel that way, um, uh, often when it comes when it comes to books. Like, like you always hear, oh, you're a writer. The, the biggest advice to writers is to read, right? You should read yeah. a lot because you, if you want to write a lot, you can't read everything. There's too much. And that's the second thing I want to say is. The problem is, is that because I feel inferior about it, it, it makes me not want to ask questions and it makes me not, like, I, I would see conversations happen in Discord, for example, about people who are like 10 years younger than me, right? And it would just make me feel kind of old because it's like, oh, you're all in university. You're learning things that I should have learned about 10 years ago, but I couldn't finish school, so I didn't. And now I don't know them. And so I'll, I'm always kind of behind, you know, and I, I wouldn't want to get involved in the conversations, but I would feel this kind of pressure to have a book list or whatever, right? Or like have a movie list, or these are the things, the video game list I guess you might have, right? These are the games I should play, these are the movies I should watch. And there's so many on there then that I go on Netflix and it's like, there's like 10 movies on here I should probably watch. And then I have some time after the kids go to bed and it's like, okay, well, which one do I want to watch? You know, like which one do I want to commit to? And the answer is like none of them because now I don't know where to start. Like, I'm overwhelmed by my own pressure that I put on myself. Mm -hmm. I think it's called uh, opportunity paralysis, isn't it? When so you I don't get anything yeah. done. Like I just sit there and I'm like, oh, I'm going to bed soon anyway. So click, 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 click on the internet. Or what are they talking about on Discord? Or what's happening on Twitter? And I could be watching a movie, but I can't make a damn decision. So I don't watch any of the movies and I don't, I don't read any of the books, you know? Like, or I try to read three or four books at the same time and it takes me forever and I get frustrated because it takes me six months to get through a book, you know, like I forget what how it started by the time I get through it. And then there were none. I think I started like two or three times because I kept forgetting who all the characters were because there were so many different characters. You didn't like that very much either, did you? I didn't like the end. Yeah, I didn't like the end. Parts of it were really? very reminiscent of how I write actually and I liked that obviously because I write like that how she had you know different perspectives different people yeah the story but i didn't agree with the end at all probably too probably, probably too strong i said it was really really bad I, I i i enjoyed the concept and i enjoyed how it was written but i didn't enjoy i didn't enjoy the end i thought and the endings really matter to me so yeah it's it's difficult when when you um you know when you're writing too because uh, there's expect there's this expectation that you've read all the classics, but you also need to have read a lot of contemporary fiction too, because mm -hmm. you're writing contemporary fiction. So that's how my list yeah. goes. It's like classics and pop pop culture stuff too. You know, you have to yeah. stay current. For a while there, I I had I had read barely any contemporary fiction. It was just all all classics that I had read. You know, in in the university time, it was just a, a lot of that. You know, barely any contemporary. But the problem with that too was I don't know if your classes were like that, but they would say okay. Some of them were like, we're reading this book. And other times they made you buy that that kit, right? That, what was it called? That course kit or whatever? Yeah, I know what you mean. And it would be like this really expensive book of like photocopied pages that had excerpts from the books that you were going to be reading. So you might only read three chapters of Murder on the Orient Express. The first three chapters, it's all you had to read. You didn't have to read the whole thing because it's all they were going to discuss was the theme or whatever, or whatever was going on in these three chapters. So I've read a lot of partial things, but I haven't read all of them right because they weren't in the course kit and they weren't on the syllabus so then uh, you know you have like a partial education and a partial experience to these these books that you talked about in class and again it was like 10 years ago now so you forget right like if you asked me what some of these things i read were like, i can't tell you there was one class i took that was on horror and terror and i'll never forget it because they had us read Anne rice and they had us read dracula and they had us read carmilla and look like, it was such a 
Doesn't it feel kind of wrong to, to, to in university class to be reading an author that's still alive? It was really cool though because it was like I, I, not wrong, not in a bad way. Mixed just, with just classic, kinda, you know. Just kind of feels kind of off. You like know, we like read Interview happen. with the Vampire, you know, and like, and we read we we read Dracula and Frankenstein and you know all these other classics. So. Someone hates this conversation. I'm sorry, unavailable jellyfish. Do you have a problem with experiencing something that someone has made, like a song, piece of literature, or a video about something and not knowing that the person who made that content had to go through trial and error, and you only see the final product and think that the particular person is so good that one thing that they never have a chance to have to change it, like they made it good from the start? Um, I used to feel that way, but I really don't feel that way anymore because I, I think that's impossible. There's always a struggle with everything that's made. Yeah, that used to get to me, but, but not anymore. The new thing that kind of annoys me is when there's, especially on YouTube, where there's a creator that um, has help, like there's someone else that's that's working with them and they're not credited properly. So it's almost like, and they're probably doing it accidentally, but it's like they, they, they're giving this impression that this is just them, but there's, there's other people helping them. Maybe there's even like a whole production crew behind them, but they still want to pass themselves off as like the, the, the guy or the girl that's just doing this out of their room, you know what I mean? And it's kind of like, this is setting up like, kind of like when there's impossible beauty standards, this is like setting up impossible production standards because you're still trying to go for this kind of like, lo-fi kind of presentation when really like, like no, it's, it's not. Like, this isn't just you and it's impossible that one person can do this, you know what I mean? So that annoys me, but it's not annoying me in a way of like, um, wow, they have like they have a much easier process than I do. It, it just annoys me because it's just not fair. I, I feel bad for anyone that's trying to trying to come up and make it. You know. I found about like 10, 15 years ago or whatever when I was going through a really bad period of depression and I didn't know what to do to help. I started watching all these interviews with people who I like uh, writers that I respected or musicians or you know just people that were like my favorite in, in their area. And a lot of them talked about their process and everything and, and stuff that they had failed at and stuff like Stephen King, like, you know, how many how many hours he puts into writing and you might never even see half of it, you know, like, for example, you know, like, I don't know if that's true, but like, just as an example, these maybe, people who... Maybe not with him. Maybe not with him, but <laughs> there was a, 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 a specific singer, songwriter, musician that, for example, said, I, I play piano every day and I write songs every day and most of them are shit and you'll never hear them, you know, and there's for good reason, you know, but I do... I do put the time in, but a lot of it is shit, and you only hear the stuff that I feel like is, and that's for most people, right? Most people aren't gonna share their first draft. You know, you're not gonna see it. So you always have to try to keep in mind that they all started somewhere too, and and everyone's a beginner in something sometime. You know, like no one's born knowing how to play a piano. You know, like you all learn have to you learn something, and and um, everyone has shit sometimes. So. That's why I think a lot of video games suffer, by the way, because uh, you, you said about first drafts. I think that a lot of video games are first drafts and they have to go up because video games are so complex that they can't really change it. And uh, it's really hard to, to, to refine. Like, I think movies can refine a lot more in the planning stages and the production stages when they're setting things up, whereas that's not really the case for a lot of things in, in video games. So you end up seeing that's like, interesting. I think so you end up that. seeing like first drafts a lot more. Okay, nobody starts. You watch a movie, they've rehearsed it lots of times, you know, you you see a, a music video or a photo shoot and it's like in between takes they were repairing her makeup, you know, you, you see so many things and it's like you don't see the behind the scenes part of, of when they're they're doing their touch ups and they're editing and they're rewriting and they're redoing and but yeah, that's interesting about video games. I never thought about that, that you're building I, off of that base. I could be wrong, but that's that's how it feels to me. Or maybe it's it's a second draft. It never gets past because like most things that you read in your experience, it's 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 like way above a second draft. Like even even the scripts and the videos that that I make are like way above a second draft. So it's like, yeah, a, a game. Even even if it is just a second draft, draft is like still. It's starting to sound like I'm saying second draft. <laughs> 
the first one, the second one. This is the second giraffe. All right. Um, I think I think we we went on a journey there. Um, hope that was okay. So I kind of feel like we drifted away from from the answer. I've been looking into actually starting to read. Be as biased as you want answering this question. What books would you recommend to a new reader? You can throw off as many as you'd like. Uh, I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Interesting. Huh. I have no idea. Uh, fuck. I would avoid some of the classics, especially some of the more dense classics. I'm telling you, the true, true Joe fashion, I'm telling you what not to read instead of what to read. Um, don't read any Shakespeare or anything like that. Like, even when you get more comfortable with, with reading books, you know, like, still don't read Shakespeare. You shouldn't read Shakespeare. You should watch Shakespeare. Like, either see a reproduction of it or, or go and see a play is, is the best way to experience Shakespeare. And then you can read it after that. Or read it, but don't expect it to be something that that really um, clicks with you all that well. And then, and then go and do that, yeah. Um, you're gonna get way more out of it seeing it performed than you are uh, reading it. Uh, a lot of schools really fuck up by doing that. I, I IMO. Apart from that, like I, I kind of would just. I, I don't think I can give you any specifics. I think I should just tell you that you know. Just do searches for what are the the best authors in certain genres and see if you if you like them. But even then, I don't know. Like, like if you want to get into horror, like do you want to? Like, do you want to start with something a little, a little, a little lighter, or something that's like really like hardcore or something? Like, like does anything to do with Lovecraft interest you? Does anything to do with kind of like like the lighter horror that's like to bring Stephen King up again? Like, do you like do do you think you're gonna like stories that are like long epics about one specific character? Do you like sci-fi? You know, like it's it's difficult to know. Like, do you, do you want to start with something that's a little more um, like you could show off a little bit, like? Uh, that's still readable. Like, do you want to start with like some Carvonica? You know, like uh, I, I don't, I don't know what anything about your taste is 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 the problem. Like, I can tell you that like my favorite fantasy series is um, it might be The Witcher now. Actually, The Witcher books. I really enjoyed The Witcher books. Uh, but before that, it was uh, the Farseer trilogy, which is now a trilogy of trilogies. Actually, there are nine books in that fucking series uh, with uh, by Robin Hobb because it's told. It, it doesn't faff about like. Tolkien and George R. R. Martin do, but like you might end up liking the, the faffing about, and it's it can be a sign of prestige, and also you can have a have take part in many conversations if you watch if, if sorry if you read Tolkien, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, The Hobbit, and um, and Game of Thrones. You know, like you might get a lot more out of that by being able to to connect with more people who read these those books because they're so popular. Like same with the King Killer Chronicles that uh, Patrick Rothfuss wrote. Um, I haven't read them myself yet because I'm waiting for him to be done but like like there's there's stuff about that that's really popular you might get into or you can have some some lighter stuff like um brandon sanderson writes um that uh jim butcher you know th those sort of things uh you could get into a really long fantasy series uh like wheel of time you know like it's i i don't i don't know uh hmm like my favorite my favorite author period is is john irving and but John Irving is, is sort of like modern Darwin. Yeah, Darwin, fucking hell. <laughs> <sighs> He's not. He's not. I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just said that. He's modern Darwin. He's modern Darwin. Sorry. Here's why. Because it's Charles Dickens and I did Charles Darwin. Um, like he's he's kind of like a, a modern Charles Dickens. Like, do you like Charles Dickens? I don't know. Charles D Charles Dickens was something that I really didn't take to until later in life. When I first tried to read Charles Dickens, I hated it. And it's like, this this is just, it's like it's impenetrable. You know what I mean? And then after like a few more years, I went back and I read Charles Dickens, and I was like, oh my god, this is so smooth. It's like holy shit. Like it's. It's so refined, it's so great, and like I really enjoyed that. Um, I think Dickens probably writes better than, than Irving does actually, but uh, I prefer Irving's uh, stories and yeah, so yeah, John Irving's my favorite. Like, like John Irving's books are like fucking long, like they don't meander though, but well, do they? I feel like almost everything in Irving's books is important, like unlike like the other books that meander kind of a bit like uh, like uh, 
like Tolkien, but I guess like Tolkien and George R. R. Martin, like a lot of it's important if you if you click with it, and that's kind of what I have to say about Irving. Like you have to click with it, but there are no like like setting the table scenes in in Irving's books, you know, literally setting the table sometimes, especially in the case of of uh, of R. R. Martin and Robert Jordan, you know, just. just just keep on talking about food and breasts, man. Like, just keep on doing it. But yeah, I think you might like Kurt Vonnegut. I would suggest, like, go with the big one and start with Slaughterhouse Five. I think you might might enjoy that. Or you might want to look at some, like, new contemporary books that come out. You know, like, we always uh, praise Gone Girl here. Like, you could read Gone Girl and then you could watch the movie. Or there might be movies that you have seen and you want to experience the book and you already know kind of what's going on. That, that would be a good idea, actually. Like, do you like Jurassic Park? You know, read Jurassic Park. I haven't read Jurassic Park, but, like, you like that's a popular movie like pick pick uh read fight club fight club is actually a really good book i've read that one i think it's great but the movie's better you know and you can you can already know going in like it, it's some of the work is already done for you because you're not big into reading you can ease yourself into it and then you can have a comparison afterwards so it can be more interesting you know that sort of thing fight club is probably not a good book to start with actually though that's a bad example D do do something else uh fight club is um Palinuic has this like this hybrid style of prose and poetry like he and, and I and I love it but it's it's quite dense and and even having read quite a lot before I read Fight Club uh it took me a while to to sink into that and adjust to it like his his um all of his scenes have a like a poetry core to them or poems core to them and they're they're usually some sort of rhythm or there's like a like a, a theme in, into how the prose is structured that he he counts down to or counts down from you know like it's it's quite interesting when you can click with it but it can make it a little difficult and sometimes he's quite vague and but i prefer when when writers are, are vague with their prose or if they're not being vague direct I, I prefer that that's my writing style too and a lot of people don't like that but that's how i like to read and that's how i like to write too so yeah, so I would suggest that look into some movies that you enjoy that were based on books and see if you can go through from there. Uh, other than that, I, I have no idea because I don't know your taste very well. Would you recommend any Lily or? I agree with what you said. Okay. My first thought was Gone Girl. My second thought was something like Mystic River or something that was maybe kind of like. Dennis Lehane. Oh. Something like a thriller. Shutter Island, I would say, over, it's over Mystic like... River kind of like almost a blend of different genres right when you have kind of like a thriller like mm -hmm. sometimes there's like a murder mystery going on or there's something psychological going on or and i wouldn't i wouldn't do any any trilogies or any any series i would stick with like a one-off book that's and a good idea yeah don't get too invested because when you when you start getting the, there's a lot of books that i like but they're 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 based on you have to read the first one and get through the first one in order to understand the second and the third one. They, they build off each other and it's it's a huge commitment. It can be kind of intimidating. So I wouldn't do anything that's long. I would stick with something that's more current and something that is more like as, as, as simple. If it's too heavy or it's it's too like it's too dense, like Irving is not a good suggestion for, for that. Maybe some Stephen King if you like sci-fi or horror, but I would stick with something like the like carry or or you know not the stand you know like not not the dark tower series you know i, I would stay as as like one off as possible and um i thought of mystic river because it used to be my favorite book but i was thinking about that in like shutter island and stuff because there were movies based off of them too so you get kind of like a thriller and you get one-off characters and, and stuff but you can also compare them to the movie you and would, I thought the books were better than the movies. So. You would like Slaughterhouse Five. You should read Slaughterhouse Five. But I haven't read it, so I can't. I can't yeah. say. No, I'm talking saying to you. you yeah, I can't you, say if if it would be a good like to get into reading kind of thing. You you want to set yourself up to be successful, right? You don't want to get into something that's too intimidating and, and too dense, and then you're like, I hate this, and throw it down. I'm frustrated. This is too much of a commitment. I, I can't follow it. Who are these characters? Like, there's some writers like Anne Rice that when she describes everything and like. And I like that. Like, there's this one book about witches that I really like, but other people would not like to hear what the flowers were in the garden and, like, <laughs> you know, you know what color they painted the full, if, full if, if they match the drapes. You know, like, like there's some people who who would not give a shit, and so that's mm. not a good a good you know style to start off with something like, you know, interview with a vampire or anything like that, right? So. Well, you said short stories. Uh, I think you would be hard pressed to find a good collection of short stories. 
Um, I don't know. I think I think it might be better just to go for for, for some short books. Uh, oh, you know, a good book. A good book if you like sci-fi and you can also watch the movie is uh, The Martian. The Martian's a really good book. That's an interesting book, and if you like sci-fi stuff, yeah, The Martian's really good. Yeah, I find there was there was a different writing style, right? Like 50 years ago or 80 years ago, right? Like we've we've changed a lot. So something more modern and more current might be easier to to mm -hmm. follow than like you said Shakespeare, and you know that's a whole other thing. But like even jumping into something like Dracula, or, you know, you might like it or you might be kind of thrown off by you know the way that they spoke and and the way that they wrote back then. I think a lot of uh, like avoiding the classics might be a good idea too because I think that a lot of the classics end up being like very different than you imagined them being, especially considering like especially someone like Dracula where it's it's been built into like his own like character that's a part of our like collective like consciousness, you know what I mean? And then you read it and it's kind of like, huh, this is a lot different than I expected it to be. So if you're gonna do a classic, I would say do something that's a shorter classic. Don't, don't get into anything like Dickens. Like I read, what was it, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I think it was called? Yeah. Jekyll and Hyde. It was really short, and it was pretty straightforward, and it, not my favorite book, but like it was it was pretty good, and it wasn't very long and intimidating, so you could get through it pretty quickly. And it's something that most of us know something about Jekyll and Hyde, right? So it's you're not going in completely not knowing anything about it. And then if you like that, then you can either go by something else in that genre, you can try a different genre, you can stick with that author, you can try something else. But at least you know you got through it, right? And kind of builds your confidence a little bit, right? Once you get through a couple books and you're like, hey, you know, you know look mm -hmm. at me. And don't let anyone shame you for getting into reading later in life. No. Don't, don't let anyone shame you for not knowing something, man. Like, never, never let anyone shame you for that. You just don't know something, whatever, it's fine. I hate it when people are like that. Oh, you don't know that? What the fuck? Like, it's, it's like, yeah, just, it's fine. Someone doesn't know something, like, what the fuck? Now they do. Great. It's never too late to pick up a new hobby or anything anyway. He doesn't know, he doesn't know. Especially in these days where anyone can learn any random piece of knowledge, knowing things doesn't carry nearly the same significant or implication that it used to. Yeah, I'm noticing a lot on Reddit too. The, the people like to like to harvest like some sort of obscure fact, and then whenever they can, they just they just unload that 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 obscure fact like onto people. And it's okay to, to, to discuss things. And I just I really dislike it when when someone says something and they try to pass it off as if like yeah I learned this on my own instead of just seeing it in some in some video that almost everyone else saw at the same time, right? Like. Um, the big one is the Leiden frost effect or the the, the Biden frost effect. Um, I think it's probably Leiden and Biden is is uh, is you know the person that wants to be president. Um, so it's like and it's like they saw that on MythBusters and now whenever it's relevant, they're like, yeah, I get to say people that I know this obscure kind of fucking thing about how when you put your your hand in water and then you can put it in a really hot temperature, there's a there's like a barrier that builds when all the the moisture goes away and now I can you're actually protected. And it's like yeah, I know exactly where I know exactly where you're getting that from and it's just like yeah. I wonder if there's a word for that. Is there a word for when you like a term for when you see someone recite some knowledge and you know exactly how they know it i feel like there should be a word for that let's make one an asshole <laughs> i would say don't overthink it just just pick one and just go for it and just dive in and uh if you don't like it, then like don't don't let anyone shame you that. Like, and if, don't finish it if you don't like it. Yeah. You don't have to finish it. No one's gonna know. Oh, he didn't finish the book and judge you for it. Like if you don't like it, don't waste your time. Go on to something else. Like if reading isn't for you, then reading isn't for you. I really regret using this pill. But sometimes a book isn't for you either. You know, and you're like it's like pulling teeth to follow it, and you're not you're not keeping up. You're you're kind of glazing over, and and then you realize you read a page and you don't even know what you read, and it's just it's not grabbing you. Then try something else. There's so many books, right, and so many genres, and just so many authors that there's there's pretty much something for for most people. Maybe not everybody, but if you don't like reading, then then it won't be for you anyway, right? But but don't don't feel like you're forced to stick with it. I used to always push myself to finish a book when I started it, and one of them like 
one of the best things was when I stopped doing that. Just, you know, just admit it's not for you and, and walk away. Or was that Stephen King book? I did that too and I hated it. I can't think of what it was now. Lily, did you, did you know after 9-11 that Steve Buscemi went back to be a firefighter to help people out? No. Tell as many people as you can whenever it comes up. I have to come up with colors. Dreamcatcher? Yes! Thank you. <laughs> yes. I just, I kept thinking about this one scene and it would probably be a spoiler so I couldn't say it. Yeah, I pushed myself to finish that book and oh, I hate it. I bitched the whole way. I got through it, but was it worth it? I tend to really like stories, at least in games and movies, so I think that books will be a nice adventure. It's good. I hope it works out for you. Hope you find something you like. Was there ever a period where you stopped reading or were tired of reading? If so, what books made you start reading again? No, I don't think so. Uh, there have been times where I haven't read for a while just because I didn't have time or uh, I was really, really busy with something else, but um, like for the for the most part, you know, even from a young age, there's, there's always been a book that I've been reading. Sort of related to the spoiler question, if there was a piece of media you could re-experience fresh, what would it be? Oh man, uh, that's been asked before. Um... Oh man. Maybe The World According to Garp by John Irving for a book. Uh, for a game, maybe like Dark Souls or, or World, of, World of Warcraft. Uh, but like I would also have to go back in time and have the time to, to, to go through that again. So that's kind of, that's not right, right? Like that's just like a time machine answer instead of anything else. Um, one of those two, I think. Uh, I think it might be interesting, like, a, Using it, like answering a different way, like like maybe to wipe my memory of Chrono Trigger to see like if it still would be my favorite game if I played it for the first time today. That would be interesting, right? But that's like taking one for the team for for um for the sake of the experiment. So I actually think that the answer would be that I wouldn't do it if it was given the chance. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind myself. What if I'm a different person because of that? But to give like an, an actual answer, yeah, for for game, uh, for game Dark Souls or World of Warcraft, if if I can get the time to play it as well, and it's and it's what it was at, at launch. Uh, for a book, I think The World According to Garp. Maybe Catch Twenty Two, but I don't think so. I I, I recently read Catch Twenty Two again, and I enjoyed it like just as much, maybe even a little bit more than I did the first time. That's my favorite book. Whereas uh, The World According to Garp. Um, is one of those things that benefits from, from, from having like a blank slate when you go in. I think it would be even, even stronger if, uh, if I had my, my memory erased of it, but I was also like still the person I am now, like I'm still a dad. Like, yeah, I think, I think it would be more poignant now reading it for the first time today. Context matters a lot. Yeah. So it's like, is, is the question a, a more deeper question about like, Hey, what would you like to experience again for the first time with a different context of your different part of your life? Or is it just what's your, what's your favorite piece of media that you just wish you could relive again? You know what I mean? Like there are two ways to take that question. And uh, I don't know which one is more interesting. Maybe the context version. If someone deleted just the experience of Dark Souls series, but you still know about the genre and games like Code or The Surge, and that'll influence your experience? Yeah. Yeah, so it's like a different different context sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. so it'd have, have to be wiped out completely, yeah. Can you playing like Code Vein and, and Surge and there are all these other games before going back and playing Dark Souls for the first time? It's happened to someone, that would be like, like what the fuck? <laughs> 